Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Tom Petty died on October 2, 2017, surrounded by his friends, family, and bandmates. For more than four decades, his quintessentially American brand of rock music won him and his band The Heartbreakers legions of fans from across the globe and made Petty one of the best-selling musicians of all time. A legendary career like that is full of stories his obituary might omit. Here's a look at the life and career of Tom Petty. Refugee Everyone has moments from their childhood that define them, and for Petty, his adult outlook was shaped by an abusive childhood, according to a 2013 interview with Men's Journal. Petty's grandfather, a logger from Georgia, married a Cherokee woman, and, family legend has it, slew a man with an axe who had a problem with the Union. His father, Earl, was raised in Florida after the family fled, and Petty said his dad was an angry drunk. Earl regularly beat Tom, his siblings, and his beloved mother, who introduced him to music, which quickly became what he called his safe place. But like the booze, the music also fueled his old man's anger. Petty suspected Earl was so mean to him because of his interest in music and the arts, which Earl found effeminate. Running Down a Dream Petty told Men's Journal in that same interview that his mother was everything to him growing up, crediting her with keeping, quote, an element of civilization in the house. Because of her, his first musical influences were crooners like Nat King Cole and the soundtrack to musicals like West Side Story. The first record Petty bought with his own money, scraped together from turning in Coke bottles, was The Marvelettes Playboy from 1962. Once the family got a television, Petty says he realized there was a great big world out there beyond his troubled life in Florida, and he longed to escape to Los Angeles, or as he called it, Television City, his way out. Around that same time, when Petty was 11, he met Elvis Presley while the King was filming Follow That Dream in Ocala, and that sealed the deal. He later told Billboard, it wasn't like meeting Jesus, but it was close. He went home, asked his mother to buy him a guitar from Sears, and started spending his free time in a local music shop. By 14, he had formed his first band, Sundowners, and never looked back. Make it better. They say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but without proper attribution, it can also get you sued in the music industry. In the last few decades of Petty's life, there were three instances of artists allegedly plagiarizing his riffs, but he never seemed bitter about any of it. And only one case ended with Petty getting a songwriting credit. In 2006, after the Red Hot Chili Peppers were accused of lifting Mary Jane's Last Dance in Danny, California, Petty told Rolling Stone, I think there are enough frivolous lawsuits in this country without people fighting over pop songs. In that same interview, Petty mentioned how The Strokes admitted to lifting parts of his American Girl for their song Last Night and said it made him laugh out loud. His laid-back attitude showed up again in 2015, when he ended up with a writing credit on Sam Smith's Stay With Me, which sounds uncannily similar to Petty's I Won't Back Down. Smith said he wasn't even familiar with Petty's song, but the two parties settled the issue amicably. Petty later told Rolling Stone there were no hard feelings and it was, quote, a musical accident. No more, no less change of heart. The year of Petty's death, Confederate statues and symbols re-emerged as a hot topic in the U.S., with many states choosing to remove iconography deemed sympathetic to the Confederacy. As it turns out, back in 1985, Petty used the Confederate flag as marketing during his Southern Accents tour, but later deeply regretted it. You grow up in the South like that, you really never beat it out of you, you know. After South Carolina took down the Confederate flag from outside its state house in 2015, Petty wrote an essay for Rolling Stone apologizing for his own use of it. He wrote that he used the flag to help illustrate a character in his song Rebels, but things got out of hand, and he had to ask fans to stop bringing the flags to his shows. He told the magazine, quote, I was pretty ignorant of what it actually meant. It's like how a swastika looks to a Jewish person. It was dumb, and it shouldn't have happened. Don't do me like that. Corporate sponsorships are the norm in rock and roll, but Petty stubbornly refused to accept them for any of his tours throughout his long career. When Billboard asked him about it in 2005, he said it was about keeping the heartbreakers independent and trustworthy to fans, telling the magazine, We started it from nothing, and we own it, and I want people to trust it. It's not for sale. Petty also refused to let his songs be used in advertising spots, saying, quote, I didn't write them to be orange juice commercials. Sometimes I feel like maybe it's a dumb move because I don't know if anyone cares, but I care immensely. Into the Great Wide Open By all accounts, Petty was in good spirits and health when he and the Heartbreakers kicked off their 40th anniversary tour in April 2017. But he hinted it might be his last, telling Rolling Stone in December 2016 that he no longer wanted to spend his life on the road. In hindsight, the entire interview is eerie and heartbreaking. After a three-year lull from touring, the longest the band had been off the road in 25 years, 
Petty told the magazine that he wanted to spend more time with his granddaughter, among other priorities, but he hadn't made up his mind about future touring. I'd be lying if I didn't say I was thinking this might be the last big one. We're very aware that time is finite. At the end of the year, we'll say, what do you feel like doing? Then we'll figure out where to go next. The Heartbreakers completed the entire run of full band shows on September 25th in Los Angeles, Petty's mythical television city. Just over a week later, the 66-year-old rock and roll legend suffered cardiac arrest at his Malibu home on the morning of October 2nd and died later that night at the hospital. In a 2014 interview with CBC News, Petty said he was born to make music. I feel that for some reason I was born with some kind of conduit to this, you know, this energy force or whatever it is. And I can have that happen through me if I really try to do it or sometimes when I'm not. As one of the greatest rock and roll bands of all time, Led Zeppelin's history has been well documented. You might think you know everything about the 70s rock gods, but there's still a couple of things out there that will surprise you. What is and what should never be. It's hard to imagine Led Zeppelin being fronted by anyone other than Robert Plant, but had Jimmy Page's first choice for Led Zeppelin's lead singer worked out, the history of rock music would be drastically different. Singer Terry Super Lungs Reed was one of Page's first choices to front his band, which was then called the New Yardbirds. But Reed had already signed with high-profile producer Mickey Most, the sweet-voiced rock prodigy had to turn down Page's offer, but suggested the guitarist take a look at Robert Plant, who he described as a Greek god. Page obviously liked what he saw in Plant, who brought along his buddy John Bonham to play the drums, and the rest is rock and roll history. Reed's career certainly wasn't a failure, but turning down Page's offer to front Led Zeppelin was the biggest mistake of anyone's career, ever. Reed wasn't the only one to be offered the gig. Page also considered Steve Marriott, singer for British rock band The Small Faces, so why didn't it happen? Marriott's manager was Don Arden, Sharon Osbourne's terrifying father, and a guy who called himself the Al Capone of pop. Don on, you know, dun dun dun. Page received a message from Arden saying, how would you like to play guitar with broken fingers? The violent rejection took the wind out of Page's sails. Everybody went back to their respective bands, and no fingers were broken. The knobs. Led Zeppelin and the New Yardbirds weren't the only names that Zepp have used on stage. Once the band played a show in Copenhagen as The Knobs. Why the name change? The name was Led Zeppelin's response to Eva von Zeppelin, the granddaughter of Ferdinand von Zeppelin, founder of the Zeppelin Airship Company, who had threatened legal action if they ever performed as Led Zeppelin in Denmark. In response, Page decided the band would change its name to The Knobs for its show in Copenhagen, calling the whole ordeal absurd. The group even tried to pacify the outraged noblewoman in person, Page recalled, the first time we played, we invited her backstage to meet us to see how we were nice young lads. We calmed her down, but on leaving the studio, she saw our LP cover of an airship in flames and she exploded. I had to run and hide. She just blew her top. Oh, the humanity. Good times, bad times. Led Zeppelin wasn't always the well-loved band it is today. Early on, some very influential critics saw the future rock icons as nothing but loud, unoriginal, overtly sexual, bombastic blowhards. In particular, Rolling Stone absolutely despised them, calling their debut album weak and unimaginative, saying that Robert Plant's vocals were prissy, and concluding that Led Zeppelin wasn't nearly as good as Cream, which had just broken up. Criticism got so bad that Zepp intentionally named the fourth album nothing at all, provided no band info, no photos of the group, and gave no interviews to promote it. They also made one of the greatest albums of all time, which probably helped ward off the critics for good. Jimmy Page wanted to cure cancer. Jimmy Page always exhibited a God-given talent on the sixth string, but playing guitar in the world's greatest rock and roll band wasn't his original goal. In April 1958, a 14-year-old Page appeared on BBC's television show All Your Own, where the prodigy demonstrated his guitar prowess in a group of skiffle musicians. After the performance, the host asked Page about his future aspirations. Can you move on? What are you going to do when you leave school? Take up skiffle? No, I want to do a... Well, biological research. In an interview with ITV five years later, a 19-year-old Page spoke of different professional goals, telling the interviewer he hoped to become an accomplished artist, which seems to have worked out. Houses of the Unholy While not a master of the actual dark arts, Jimmy Page was certainly interested in them, enough to buy what some might call the most evil house in Great Britain. That would be Aleister Crowley's Boleskin House, which the occultist magician bought in 1899. Page bought the house in the 1970s, and though he never really lived there, he visited enough to be permanently tied to it in the public eye. 
being filmed in and around the house with glowing red eyes in the Zeppelin concert film, the song remains the same. Legend maintains that Crowley was called away in the middle of a ritual that had summoned demons to the residence, and he just never cleaned the place up. The person who actually lived there, Page's childhood friend Malcolm Dent, stayed there for 20 years before Page sold the place. As he told the Inverness Courier in a 2006 interview, doors would be slamming all night. You'd go into a room and carpets and rugs would be piled up. Even though he's a self-described skeptic, Dent couldn't explain why any of this was happening. Still, it's kind of surprising he never called anyone about it. We're ready to believe you! As far as icons of rock go, it's hard to imagine anyone bigger than Mick Jagger. The Rolling Stones frontman has been a household name for decades now, but many people still know surprisingly little about him. This is the untold truth of Mick Jagger. I'm just gonna do what I do, that's what I do. Yeah, alright, we'll just do it! Alright then. Well, that's done and dusted then, ain't it? <laughs> By the way, you look great. Jagger comes from far more humble beginnings than many of today's rock stars. His father, Basil Jagger, was a phys ed teacher, while his mother, Ava, was also a teacher. He was born in 1943 in the middle of World War II, making that crossfire hurricane line from Jumpin' Jack Flash a reference to the Luftwaffe bombers that were strafing England at the time. Of course, this was a time when families didn't have phones or televisions and needed to make their own entertainment. Members of the Jagger family would take turns dancing, playing instruments, or, in his case, doing impressions and song and dance routines. By the time he was 14, he was regularly sneaking out of the house to hang out with local bands. Jagger told the Irish Independent, It was like fun. I could see I got a good reaction. It all took off from there, but according to Jagger, his parents weren't exactly happy when he told them he was giving up his spot at the London School of Economics for a career in music. Much later, however, he would also credit his parents with giving him a centered upbringing that kept him from descending fully into the self-destructive behavior that takes the lives of so many musicians. He told the talks, When you are young and you have a sort of close family life and stuff, it helps you to be centered for later. It's easy to think that someone who lives in the spotlight must be well adapted to public attention, but according to Rolling Stone, Jagger is actually pretty strict about holding on to what little privacy he has managed to maintain. He hates being interviewed, for example, especially when the subject touches on anything but music. And when he does sit down with a journalist, interviews only usually last for about 20 minutes. When the Irish Independent reached out to him ahead of the Stones' 2018 show in Dublin, they asked him why he didn't make appearances on talk shows. He simply countered, why do things you don't need to? But there's more to it than that, and Jagger seems cautious of just how important he is to many people. He explained, People have this obsession. They want you to be like you were in 1969. They want you to because otherwise their youth goes with you, you know. It's very selfish, but it's understandable. Image is, this image thing is just a, a thing of media. People have many, many facets of personality, and that includes me. Jagger hasn't even released a memoir, despite the success enjoyed by Keith Richards' own memoir, which came out in 2011. When asked about writing one, Jagger said, You don't want to end up like some old footballer in a pub talking about how he made the cross in the cup final in 1964. It was once the goal of any aspiring British musician to get big in America. Hopping across the pond and scoring a hit in the American charts was a marker for success for practically every group worth their salt. This was also true for Mick Jagger and the Stones, but once he got there, he wasn't impressed by what he found. When the Stones went on tour in 1964, they hit some of America's biggest cities. Jagger told Rolling Stone that New York City was wonderful and Los Angeles, quote, was also kind of interesting, but he had less kind things to say about the rest of the country. Jagger explained, Outside of that, we found it the most repressive society, very prejudiced in every way. There was still segregation, and the attitudes were fantastically old-fashioned. Americans shocked me by their behavior and their narrow-mindedness. When the Irish Independent asked Jagger just what he was thinking when he wrote Brown Sugar, the answer wasn't one you would have expected. Jagger simply said, I really don't know, and I was in Australia when I wrote it, so you can add that to the top of it in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So I don't really know what was going through my mind. Jagger told Rolling Stone that one of the very first songs he ever wrote was As Tears Go By, a song famously performed by Marianne Faithful, which the band have no intentions of ever recording themselves. Of course, Satisfaction was their biggest hit. Jagger wrote Satisfaction while sitting beside a pool in Tampa, Florida, and has since told Rolling Stone that most of his best writing is done while he's touring. He explained, It's the best place to write because you're just totally into it. You get back from a show, have something to eat, get a few beers, and just go to your room and write. I used to write about 12 songs in two weeks on tour. It gives you lots of ideas. 
Welcome to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, where you'll experience the complete rock and roll lifestyle without the lawsuits and STDs. The Rolling Stones concert at Altamont, California in 1969 was one of the moments that defined the decade. It was a free concert announced only days before it actually took place, which quickly became a perfect storm of poor decision-making. From placing the concert site nearer to a local freeway to recruiting the Hells Angels to act as security. By the time the day was done, four people were dead, including 18-year-old Meredith Hunter, who died at the hands of the gig's so-called security. Nobody could count how many had been injured. According to a deep dive into the event written by Rolling Stone magazine, an associate of the band explained, Jagger was very, very shattered. I cannot overemphasize how depressed and down he was with the way it turned out. When they knew about the murder, it shook them. Sympathy for the Devil became the song most associated with the chaos of Altamont, and Jagger later told Rolling Stone that it took a while before he felt he could perform it again. While the concert was touted in the media as the end of an era, Jagger has said he didn't feel that was the case, he simply felt depressed over the fact it had happened at all. Jagger said, That particular burden didn't weigh on my mind. It was more how awful it was to have had this experience, and how awful it was for someone to get killed, and how sad it was for his family, and how dreadfully the Hells Angels behaved. In 2008, the BBC ran a documentary about the FBI. During the program, reporters spoke with a former agent named Mark Young who revealed that, after the tragedy at Altamont, Mick Jagger found himself the victim of a botched assassination attempt. In the wake of the event, Jagger had condemned the actions of the Hells Angels. Members of the gang vowed to get their revenge and formed a plan to kill him at his holiday home in the Hamptons. According to The Telegraph, the Hells Angels had planned to infiltrate his property from the coast in order to dodge Jagger's security team. They had hopped on a boat and were heading over to his house when a storm swept through the area. Everyone on board was dumped into the ocean, putting a quick end to their attempt on his life. Young also added that Jagger had never been told about the planned assassination. Luckily, law enforcement never got wind of another planned attack. When asked about his friendship with Stone's guitarist Keith Richards, Mick Jagger told Rolling Stone, I can't remember when I didn't know him. Sea tells me. Over the years, these two men have become arguably one of the most legendary duos in music history. But it's also no secret that Keith Richards has always had something of a relationship with hard drugs. He is the only man on the planet who can go anthrax. <laughs> all right. So how have the two kept it together all these years? While Jagger has said that he doesn't like talking about the drug problems of others, he has talked a little bit about how Richard's drug use has impacted him. He said, How did I handle it? Oh, with difficulty. It's never easy. I don't find it easy dealing with people with drug problems. If you're really on some heavily addictive drug, you think about the drug and everything else is secondary. You try and make everything work, but the drug comes first. Even when he was at his worst, Jagger says that Richard's was still creative, it just took a long, long time to get anything done. Jagger explained, When Keith was taking heroin, it was very difficult to work. It affected everyone in certain ways, but I've never really talked to Keith about this stuff, so I have no idea what he feels. It's not just about living forever, Jackie. The trick is living with yourself forever. There are the Rolling Stones, and then there's Rolling Stone magazine. Obviously, you'd expect there to be a relationship between the two, but might not expect it to be quite as tense as it is. According to Joe Hagen's biography of Jan Wenner, the magazine's founder, Jagger was outraged when he first heard of the magazine. Not only was it a surprise that it had been named after the group, but the original Rolling Stones weren't even given the honor of appearing on the mag's first cover. Hagen writes that the offense kicked off a feud that lasted for the next five decades. The band took action, too, hitting Winner and Rolling Stone with a cease and desist letter instead of the exclusive interview Winner had promised new readers. Tensions continued to run high for years afterwards, even after Jagger and Winner met and the Stones finally appeared on the cover. Bizarrely, at one point, Jagger and Winner actually teamed to launch a British based Rolling Stone, which ended up full of politics and misspellings, written by an unruly, drug fueled staff. Winner was outraged, but by the time he got the magazine under control, Jagger had gotten bored with the whole thing and headed off to Australia to appear in an art house movie. In their 1969 obituary for Stone's ex-guitarist Brian Jones, Rolling Stone magazine called him an embodiment of the music itself. It was an apt description for a deeply talented musician. Jones died at the bottom of a swimming pool after years of drug abuse and scandals, having become widely known as the band's notorious wild child. When Jagger spoke with Rolling Stone almost three decades later, he opened up about the legendary falling out between Jones and the band. 
Jagger said that recording the song No Expectations was the last time Jones was, quote, totally involved in something that was really worth doing. The falling out happened gradually, but eventually left Jagger and the band feeling they had no choice but to fire him, particularly when it got to the point where Jones couldn't even hold his guitar. Drug addiction wasn't well understood at the time, however, and Jagger has admitted to feeling a little guilty over how the issue was handled. Jagger said, In some ways, we picked on him, but unfortunately he made himself a target for it. He was very, very jealous, very difficult, very manipulative, and if you do that in this kind of a group of people, you get back as good as you give, to be honest. Bob Seger has plugged away on his guitar for more than 50 years, but there's more to the man than his hit songs. From his athletic background to his retirement, there's a whole lot of untold truth about this classic rocker. Most people contain multitudes, and that's certainly true of Bob Seger. In addition to being a talented musician, he's also a lifelong athlete and competitor. Back in high school in Michigan, he really wanted to play football, specifically the glorious position of quarterback, but he couldn't cut it on the gridiron, leading him to turn to track and field instead. His years of hoofing it as fast as he could inspired one of his most beloved songs. As he told the Mercury News in 2019, I always wanted to write a song about being a runner. I don't think anybody got that, but that's where the Against the Wind title came from. I was a long distance runner. And I think that's where uh, in high school, and I think that's where I get my tenacity. Seeger races against the wind, not just on land, but also on the water. In 2001, his sailboat Lightning won the Port Huron to Mackinac race in Michigan. And it turns out that he's quite the hands-on owner. Lightning crew member Mike Thompson told a boating publication, Everybody took turns steering the boat, and he was in the rotation just like everybody else. When Seeger was still a teenager in high school in the early 60s, he cut his musical teeth as a guitarist and vocalist in a number of Detroit-area bands. His first real group was a trio called The Decibels, in which he played alongside Eddie Andrews, who would later manage Seeger's career. After moving to Ann Arbor, Michigan, Seeger joined a band called The Town Criers, then switched teams again to play keyboard with Doug Brown and The Omens. After a name change to the mildly humorous Beach Bums, the group released a single called The Ballad of the Yellow Beret, a parody of Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler's 1966 ultra-patriotic The Ballad of the Green Berets. Seeger's version mocked Vietnam War-era draft dodgers, and it could have been at least a local hit had Sadler not threatened to sue, forcing the record to be pulled out of stores. Later in 1966, Seeger went solo, scoring some Michigan hits with East Side Story and Heavy Music, only for his label Cameo Records to go out of business. After a brief sojourn to college, he returned to music in 1969 and redoubled his efforts to make it big. Although Seeger reached the heights of his fame in the 70s, he scored his first hit in early 1969. Ramblin' Gamblin' Man, officially credited to the Bob Seeger system, hit number 17 on the Billboard pop chart. But that didn't quite solidify Seeger's mainstream success or national stature. He kept releasing singles and albums in the early 70s to very little attention. He was essentially a one-hit wonder for a while, as Ramblin' Gamblin' Man was his only top 40 hit until Night Moves landed in the top 5 in 1976. From that point on, Seeger was a hit machine around the country and the world, as he already had been in some parts of the Midwest for years. While he was a relatively obscure act for most Americans in the early 70s, he was a superstar in his home state of Michigan. In the same week in 1976 that he played to a small crowd of people in a random Chicago bar, he also took the stage in front of 76,000 screaming fans at the Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan. Bob Seger has paid more dues than all the artists in the current Billboard Top 40 combined. Perhaps the reason why Seeger's songs have resonated with so many people for so long is because of their authenticity. Tunes like Night Moves feel so emotionally real because they are, as the singer-songwriter pulled from real-life events to craft his compositions. Writing so mysterious, I do it all different kinds of ways. During an interview on In the Studio with Redbeard, Seeger revealed that he really got to work on his Night Moves with a dark-haired Italian girl whom he dated when he was 19. According to the book Encyclopedia of Great Popular Song Recordings, that woman was Renee Andretti, Seeger's first real girlfriend as a teenager. But the romance, while monumental, ultimately proved ill-fated. The singer told the Detroit Free Press in 1994, Her boyfriend was in the service, and when he came back, she married him. My first broken heart. Fortunately, Seeger was able to get over that disappointment. He's been married to his third wife, Juanita Doricott, since 1993. And the rest of the world got night moves out of the whole experience, so it ended well for everyone. 
The Eagles were one of the most popular bands of the 70s. Their country-influenced sound was synonymous with the decade. They were also a bit of a supergroup, as they were packed with individually successful performers and songwriters such as Don Henley, Joe Walsh, and Glenn Fry. Despite that rock and roll brain trust, the band grew utterly stumped when working on an out-of-character, hard-rocking stomper of a song for their 1979 album The Long Run. According to Eagles guitarist Don Felder, when the band realized that Fry's vocals were underrepresented on the album, Fry, Henley, and collaborator J.D. Souther forged a nugget of a song. It was an up-tempo, hand-clap-driven number. There was one problem, though. They couldn't come up with a chorus. And that's when Fry decided to seek outside help in the form of Bob Seger. Fry called him up and sang what he and the other Eagles had come up with, all the way up to where the chorus should go. Then, from out of thin air, Seger pulled out the melody of that chorus and subsequently the title of the song. The result was Heartache Tonight. Seeger was credited as a co-writer, and the song went on to become the fifth and final number one hit for the Eagles. I actually wrote the Heartache Tonight no. part, and Glenn wrote all the verses, and then Don and, and, and J.D. Souther finished the song. Seeger has often presented himself as a voice of the common man, blue-collar working-class individuals who, like Seeger, come from a humble Midwestern background. That's a big reason why he's allowed his song Like a Rock to be used for years in commercials for American-made Chevrolet trucks. It's also an attitude that prompted him to make a relatively bizarre request of his record label. The 8-track tape exploded in popularity in the late 60s and into the 70s. It was superior to vinyl records in at least one regard. Music was portable on the compact tapes, and automakers responded by outfitting cars and trucks with 8-track decks. However, the more streamlined cassette eventually overtook the 8-track as the portable music format of choice. By 1982, record labels had pretty much phased it out, but Bob Seger thought it was a disservice to the public. He told People Magazine in 1983, There are thousands of fans out there who still have old 8-tracks in their pickups or RVs. Times are tough. A lot of them don't have the money to get a new system. So, per Seeger's behest, Capitol Records released his 1982 album The Distance on 8-track. While Seeger continued to pack arenas and stadiums into the 90s, and most of his biggest songs can still be heard on any classic rock radio station today, the hit singles period of his career started to die out in the late 80s. However, his final top 10 hit just happened to be his biggest. In 1987, he reached number one for the first and only time with Shakedown, his groovy, R&B-heavy contribution to the Beverly Hills Cop 2 soundtrack. A commercial triumph for the veteran rocker, Shakedown also earned Seeger a nomination for Best Original Song at the Academy Awards. But interestingly enough, the song originally wasn't his. Beverly Hills Cop 2 producers had hired Glenn Fry, who'd had a big hit with The Heat Is On from the first Beverly Hills Cop, to record a song for the sequel. According to the Billboard Book of Number 1 Hits, Fry didn't like the verse lyrics written by composers Keith Forsey and Harold Faltermeyer. Furthermore, he contracted laryngitis just before he was supposed to lay down vocals. After Fry pulled out, MCA Records president Irving Azoff called Seeger, asking him to write new lyrics and record the song. Perhaps the most recognizable song in the Bob Seeger catalog is Old Time Rock and Roll. Thanks to its iconic opening piano riff, Seeger's howling vocal delivery, and a blistering sax solo, it scraped into the top 30 on the Billboard Hot 100 when it was originally released as a single in 1979. It later became a song for the ages when it was used in that famous scene in 1983's Risky Business, in which a young Tom Cruise dances around in his underwear. But as it turns out, old-time rock and roll was almost an afterthought, recorded late in production for the album Stranger in Town. It was brought to Seeger by Alabama songwriter George Jackson. Seeger liked the chorus, but not the verses, so he wrote those himself. However, he didn't think the song was ever going to be a single, let alone a hit, so he didn't bother to list himself as a songwriter. That means he missed out on untold riches and royalties. As he told a radio interviewer in 2006, that was the dumbest thing I ever did. In 1994, the same year that Seeger released his Greatest Hits album, he also appeared in a music video for Night Moves, almost 20 years after the song's original release. The video evokes the song's wistful nostalgia. It's shot in a dreamy, soft focus and set in a drive-in movie theater sometime in the distant, romanticized past. Young people flirt and mill about, including a central couple played by Daphne Zuniga of Melrose Place and Matt LeBlanc just before Friends debuted and made him a household name. Believe it or not, Seeger actually did a little acting coaching. As LeBlanc revealed on an episode of Top Gear, Seeger summoned the actor to his trailer and told him what it was like back when he was young and would go to the drive-in and try to pick up girls. Then the rocker produced a bottle of tequila. Next thing I know, we down a whole bottle of tequila, Bob Seger and I, and then they knock on the door, ready for you on set. <laughs> so like, I'm drunk in the whole video. <laughs> Even though both Seger and LeBlanc were in various states of drunkenness for the video shoot, everything seemed to work out okay in the end. 
LeBlanc has had a long and steady acting career, while Seeger's greatest hits went on to be certified diamond after selling over 10 million copies in the United States. After Seeger's career slowed down in the 90s, he quietly retired from the music business with the aim of focusing on family life. He told CBS Sunday Morning in 2007, I had kids at age 47 and very late in life, and I'd been doing it for 30 straight years, writing songs, making a record, and touring and starting the process right over. Then I had the kids and, you know, it might be a good time to slow down and watch them grow up. You're never going to get another chance to see it. After his 1995 album It's a Mystery, he didn't release another album until 2006's Face the Promise. He toured in support of it in 2007, his first set of concert dates since 1996. Of course, Seeger isn't getting any younger, and all those years of living on the road have taken their toll on him. In 2017, the year he turned 72 years old, he ruptured a disc just before he was supposed to embark on a concert tour. His doctor told him that if symptoms worsened, he'd have to cancel the tour and undergo surgery. Well, Seeger ended up awakening one morning in September 2017 with a dragging left leg. A few days later, his management announced that the remaining 18 dates on his tour schedule would be indefinitely postponed. Those health troubles prompted him to retire once again, as he announced that his traveling man tour in 2018 and 2019 would be the last time he would hit the road. Keith Richards is a revered veteran of the music industry and quite possibly one of the last true rock stars still walking the earth. The guitar maestro of the Rolling Stones has been living his hardest, most Keith Richards life since the 1960s. Here's the untold truth of Keith Richards. Keith Richards has been around for such a long time that it can be hard to imagine him as an innocent child, yet he was, and according to The Guardian, young Richards had surprisingly goody-two-shoes hobbies. The rock legend used to be a Boy Scout. According to the Daily Beast, his Boy Scout past as head of a beaver patrol taught him valuable lessons about teamwork and leadership. However, it looks like he already had a rock star streak during his time with them, seeing as he was eventually discharged for getting into a fight with another young scout. <laughs> but According to the DW, Richards was also in choir. Believe it or not, his career as a choir boy was actually quite impressive. He sang soprano and performed at Westminster Abbey for Queen Elizabeth II, although he later swore allegiance to another royal icon. Keith calls Mick Her Majesty. Richard's time in a choir seems to have left its mark on him. The Telegraph reports that the guitarist and a number of his Jamaican Rastafari friends have a group they call Jamaica's Wingless Angels. The group has been active since the 1970s and uses old choral hymns, chanting, and drumming to create sparse, repetitive songs. While there is a thread that connects their music to Richard's early choir days, this group of singers is much, much more fun to hang out with. Mick Jagger and Keith Richards form one of the most famous partnerships in rock history, but the Glimmer Twins have always had their ups and downs. According to the Washington Post, their first great public rift concerned Jagger's solo debut in 1985 and his subsequent refusal to tour the Stones' 1986 album Dirty Work. This plunged the band into years of conflict that Richards described as World War III. Although Jagger and Richards managed to patch things up and bring the show back on track in 1989, public barbs and tactical apologies eventually started flying again. In his 2010 memoir, Life, Richards admitted that he hasn't visited Jagger's dressing room in decades because he doesn't enjoy hanging out with his old friend anymore. The guitarist wrote that in the 1980s, Jagger started to become an unbearable presence and had a larger-than-life ego. Although Jagger was upset by some of the revelations in his bandmate's memoir, Richards told Rolling Stone magazine, I was going to tell the story. As I told Mick, you should have seen what I left out. Let's just hope Jagger isn't featured in Richards' next book. Next one is a murder mystery. <laughs> Actor and model Anita Pallenberg is an influential figure in the Rolling Stones' history. According to The Guardian, she visited the band backstage in 1965 and started a relationship with the band's other guitarist, Brian Jones. The relationship soon turned violent, and Pallenberg left Jones for Richards. The two lived together in London, where they had three children. The Guardian also reported that Pallenberg's influence in the band went far beyond their guitar slinger's significant other. She performed backing vocals on Sympathy for the Devil, and Richards was convinced that she had an affair with Mick Jagger when the two shot a movie together. This allegedly inspired the guitarist to write one of Rolling Stone's most famous and brutal songs, Gimme Shelter. Through the years, Richards and Pallenberg struggled with substance abuse issues, drifted apart, and finally separated in 1980. Vanity Fair says around the same time, Richards met Patty Hansen at the legendary Studio 54. Hansen was the perfect match for Richards, and their relationship was a much more stable one. Their marriage has lasted for almost four decades. 
In April 1971, Keith Richards rented a luxurious property called Villain El Cot at the French Riviera to record their Exile on Main Street album. Villain El Cot had a pretty bad history, as it had been the Nazi headquarters during their occupation of France. There were still swastikas painted in the basement when Richards rolled in and turned the place into a curious mix of a backstage and a partially wrecked hotel room. Along with Villain El Cot's Nazi history and the continuous stream of drug dealers, hangers-on, and famous visitors, the heat, dripping walls, and bad air circulation on the basement level all contributed to the building's weird vibe. According to the star, this was reflected on the finished double album Swampy Sounds. Today, Exile on Main Streets is one of the band's most acclaimed and enduring works. However, Villain El Cot is unlikely to become a popular pilgrimage for fans, despite its importance in the group's history. On top of it being a remote location that's quite hard to reach, the villa's current owner makes it clear that fans who want to visit the property will not be welcomed. Get off my lawn. Keith Richards has a long-standing friendship with singer-songwriter Tom Waits. According to Rolling Stone, this goes back to Waits' 1985 album Rain Dogs. Richards has contributed guitar parts and vocals for several Waits songs, and in 2013, the two recorded a growling version of the sea shanty Shenandoah. They're so close that Waits once wrote a tongue-in-cheek poem called Keith Richards to honor the guitarist. It compares Richards to a praying mantis because, as Waits strangely says, he only has one ear and it's located between his legs. What? According to Ultimate Classic Rock, Waits reveres Richards but describes the dynamic between the two as one that needs an adult in the room. The musicians once got together to co-write some songs for Waits' Bad As Me album, but the process proved to be less than fruitful. Richards would suddenly call out, Scribe. When Waits wondered what was going on, Richards said it again, now pointing a finger at him. At that point, Waits realized that Richards was looking for someone to write down the music they had been improvising into existence for an hour, and that someone was Tom Waits. Look, uh, I'm gonna have to rethink this. Keith Richards may be a rock legend whose music is loved by millions, but his own taste in music holds a few surprises. According to Billboard, Richards likes both Amy Winehouse and Lady Gaga. He also respects singer Tony Bennett enough to say that if he likes Gaga, that means she must be great. BBC says that Richards is a fan of old music such as blues, gospel, jazz, and reggae, but isn't above lavishing praise on individual, even modern artists. Florence and the Machine, James Bay, and reggae legend Gregory Isaacs have all received positive mentions from Richards. He also seems to like Ed Sheeran. Richards has seen Sheeran play live more than once and enjoys his one-man band style. Though he does appear to think that the young artist's name is Ed Sheenan. Ed Sheenan I really like, the little one-man band. On the other hand, Richards doesn't particularly seem to enjoy artists who are closer to his own genre. He has been known to dismiss Led Zeppelin as a little hollow, though he does respect Jimmy Page. He's described the Grateful Dead as boring shit, and harder acts like Metallica and Ozzy Osbourne's Black Sabbath as great jokes. We're sure Ozzy would love to have a few words with Keith about that comment. You know what I mean? I mean, like, oh, again. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, I must go to the John. <laughs> Keith Richards is famous for his extravagant style that features loud jackets, scarves, and accessories. According to The Telegraph, his style is actually incredibly simple and not even entirely his own. He just raids the wardrobes of the women in his household. The man whose style inspired the costume of Johnny Depp's Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies has worn women's clothes for decades. In 2016, he said the majority of his clothes are actually just borrowed from his daughters and his wife, Patty Hansen. Richards insists that however outlandish his clothes might seem, they're just things he likes to wear, not deliberate costumes. His daughter Alexandra has backed up this claim, saying Richards just has the ability to wear anything, including his wife's pajama pants, and make it look great. Jagger, on the other hand, can make almost anything look great. Keith Richards has been through so much that it's generally regarded as a miracle that he's lived such a long and distinguished life. Richards has been dodging the Grim Reaper since he was born. Ultimate Classic Rock says the guitarist tribulation started during the London bombings in 1944 when a Nazi V-1 bomb hit the infant Richard's cot. Fortunately, baby Keith and his mother had already evacuated the area. In 1965, his microphone gave him an electric shock during a performance, burning the strings of his guitar and knocking him unconscious. In 1971, Richard's fell asleep while smoking in bed. The cigarette lit the bed on fire and almost burned him to a crisp. 
In 1973, another fire burned down Richard's Redlands estate, though he insisted that a wire-chewing rodent was to blame rather than a passed-out rock star. At some point in the 1970s, he had the worst drug experience of his life when someone laced his drugs with poisonous strychnine. Later in life, his incidents have become more mundane, but no less dangerous. In 1998, Richard slipped and fell while reaching for a book in his library and broke several ribs when heavy books fell on him. In 2006, he had an unfortunate experience with a palm tree while foraging for coconuts in Fiji. Richard's cracked his skull so badly that he needed brain surgery. Despite all of his brushes with death and the damage he's done to his body, Richards actually looks pretty decent for his age. Keith Richards looked 70 when he was 40, and now that he's 70, he looks 69. He's regenerating. It's probably no surprise that the Rolling Stones have visited one of the most notorious temples of debauchery, the Playboy Mansion. What may come as a surprise is that Keith Richards once nearly set it on fire. According to the New Zealand Herald, Richard says when they were visiting the mansion, he and the band's saxophone player Bobby Keys stole their tour doctor's bag and, more importantly, the multitude of drugs it contained. They locked themselves in one of the Playboy Mansion's bathrooms and started sampling everything. Suddenly, they heard a fire alarm. People were running down the corridor, so they left the scene, at which point it burst into flames. They had accidentally started a fire. Richard tells another version of the story in his memoir. As he and Keyes were busy dealing with the array of drugs, they suddenly noticed that the room was getting quite smoky. The drapes of the bathroom were already smoldering, and everything was just about to go off big time when they heard banging on the door. A bunch of waiters and men in black suits stormed in, carrying buckets of water. The two musicians sat on the floor with their pupils constricted to pinpoints, annoyed at the way their private celebration had been interrupted. I'm lucky, lucky to be here, man. It's amazing, huh? Let's just get this out of the way here. Keith Richards really likes to tell the story about him snorting his father's ashes. He has told NME that he couldn't resist mixing some of the ashes with his cocaine and that his father wouldn't have cared. The version he told GQ paints the incident as a semi-accidental one in which he intended to spread the ashes to fertilize an oak tree, but when he pulled the top off the box that contained his father's mortal remains, some of the ashes landed on the table. After that, he just had, quote, a line of dad because it felt right. I wouldn't eat him, you know, but I snorted him. Even before the snorting incident made them truly inseparable, the father and son were close. According to the Irish Mirror, Richards and his father Herbert spent 20 years without contact, until the guitarist finally reached out in the early 1980s. Their reunion was successful, and over the next two decades, Richards introduced his father to the lifestyle of a Rolling Stone. In turn, he discovered that his father could drink them all under the table. At the time of Herbert's death, the two got along so well that Richards felt comfortable with, as he says, ingesting his ancestor. Now he wants to make it a family tradition. When he dies, Richard says that he wants his family to do the same with his ashes. <laughs> I love this shit. I love this shit. The death of Rick Ocasek in September 2019 shocked fans of his seminal band The Cars. Though you're probably familiar with all their hits, there's a lot you probably don't know about the legendary group. Here's a few quick facts to get you up to speed. Perhaps because of his striking look, or because he sang most of the band's songs, the Cars and Rick Ocasek are often considered one and the same. Hi, I'm Rick Ocasek, and I turned confusion into a virtue. But Benjamin Orr took on lead vocal duties on plenty of the Cars songs, including classics like Just What I Needed, Drive, and Moving in Stereo. Greetings, my name is Benjamin Orr. I play bass and I'm one of the lead singers for the Cars. And this is my face. As you may know, Moving in Stereo features prominently in an iconic scene from Fast Times at Ridgemont High and was also a clever musical cue in an episode of Stranger Things. Casual listeners may not have realized that the band had two lead singers because their voices are rather tough to distinguish from each other. In 2011, Okasik told Vanity Fair, I think our voices are similar because we spent so many years together even before the Cars. Every band I've ever been in had both of us. Okasik later told Rolling Stone, We were the best of friends forever. Nevertheless, by the end of the Cars' last tour in the late 80s, Orr had taken to traveling on his own bus, apart from the other band members, and rarely exchanging words with Okasik. In Okasik's own words, he was drinking a little much. Okasik also told Rolling Stone that tension mounted after Orr asked if he could write car songs with his girlfriend. Okasik rejected the idea outright. The former besties and musical partners grew estranged after the car split up in 1988. 
Fortunately, they worked out their differences while taping material for a Cars DVD in the late 90s. Orr died of pancreatic cancer in 2000, and Okasik paid tribute with the song Silver. Fresh off his Academy Award-winning role in Ordinary People, actor Timothy Hutton wanted to get into directing. In 1984, the Cars manager played him the group's album Heartbeat City. Hutton was particularly taken with Drive, a slick, romantic, soft rock ballad that represented a departure for the band. Rick Okasik let Hutton direct a video for the song. In the book I Want My MTV, Hutton recalled, I called a casting director and said I needed an attractive, exotic woman who has something fierce about her. He hired model Polina Poroskova, who was among the last women he saw while casting the video. As he explains it, he took Poroskova and Okasik into a hotel room to rehearse the plot of the video. I asked them to imagine they'd had a fight that was escalating. They rehearsed with Hutton for an entire day, and when it was all over, Poroskova and Okasik wanted to keep going. Sparks had obviously flown. Although Poroskova later told Entertainment Weekly that she'd already seen Okasik on MTV, explaining that it was love before first sight. Okasik was already married at the time to his second wife. In 1989, Okasik and Poroskova got married, and they stayed together for nearly 30 years. The Cars recorded plenty of sharp, tightly crafted songs, but even though they're short and sweet, those songs could reportedly take forever to make. According to Cars drummer David Robinson, the band's 1981 hit Shake It Up stewed for years before the group finally decided to record it. In Frozen Fire, the story of the Cars, he said, It never sounded good. We recorded it a couple of times in the studio and dumped it, and we were going to try it one more time, and I was fighting everybody. Robinson says he relented when the band decided to give it a total overhaul. We thought, let's start all over again, like we'd never even heard it, completely change every part, and we did. But it doesn't sound like the song was one of Rick Ocasek's faves. Speaking to Vanity Fair, he admitted, I've probably written some crap lyrics. I'm not proud of the lyrics to shake it up. Perhaps that's because the song includes lines like, do the move with the quirky jerk, and make the night cat stop and stare. You might think is arguably the car's most memorable song, and that's probably because of its unforgettable music video. The car's rise to the top coincided with the early days of MTV, and the band was one of the first acts to embrace the new medium. The video's director Jeff Stein evidently had a tough time selling the band on the idea for the video. In I Want My MTV, he recalled, I met the cars and told them, the band's in the medicine chest, and then on a bar of soap, and Rick's on a fly. And one of them said, why don't we just all play on a turd in the toilet bowl? That was the prevailing attitude. According to Elektra Records executive Robin Sloan, Rick Ocasek didn't like the video, explaining that he thought it made fun of the way he looked. Of course, it all paid off in the end. The video was the first one ever placed in the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection, and at the first MTV Video Music Awards in 1984, you might think won Video of the Year, somehow defeating Michael Jackson's iconic thriller. As we mentioned, the cars ultimately broke up in 1988. At some point, <laughs> something kind of cracked. <laughs> Maybe it was around 87. And then I didn't like it as much. But there was an attempt to resurrect the band in the mid-2000s. That's when a manager representing Greg Hawks, Elliot Easton, and David Robinson approached Rick Okasik, proposing a Cars reunion on behalf of his clients. Okasik gave him a hard no, explaining to Rolling Stone, The hit the fan. Lawyers got involved. It must have cost a ton of money in legal fees that I wasted. The Cars wasted. For no reason. So Easton and Hawks hit the road in 2006 and 2007 as the new Cars. Robinson didn't participate. He dropped out of the project early on. But rock legend and producer Todd Rundgren and the Tubes drummer Prairie Prince agreed to join the project. It didn't work out. The new Cars' poorly reviewed debut album It's Alive would also be their last album. In the early 2010s, a real Cars reunion happened. Rick Ocasek told Rolling Stone at the time, This was strictly f everything that's happened before this. This is a new thing. And it was great. The Cars reconvened to record a new album of original material, Move Like This, which generated a moderate hit single in Sad Song. The group even embarked on one last tour in the summer of 2011, performing in 11 theaters and capping it off with the spot at Lollapalooza. There's a lot of people out there, and some will like us and some won't, and that'll be it. Then in 2018, the group entered the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In his induction speech, Brandon Flowers of The Killers, a huge fan, said, We thank the Cars, Rick, Benjamin, David, Greg, and Elliot. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. This band means so much to me and millions of others. That night would mark the last official Cars gig. Rick Ocasek died on September 15, 2019 at the age of 75.
As people learn the sad news, many celebs fondly remember the talented musician, including talk show host Stephen Colbert, who was fortunate enough to occasionally have Okasik as a guest on The Colbert Report. I'm going to need someone who can use his brute animal magnetism to woo that lady zookeeper. Rick Okasik? You bet I'm in, Stephen. <laughs> Queen is one of those bands that can be easy to overlook. They're the kind of band you take for granted because you can't remember a time when they weren't there. So there's often a lot that most people don't know about them. With that in mind, here's a deep dive into one of history's most ubiquitous rock and roll acts. Freddie's Beginnings Shocking though it might be, Freddie Mercury wasn't the given name of Queen's frontman. He was actually born into a devout Zoroastrian family to parents from India. His birth name? Farooq Bolsara. He was actually born in Zanzibar, but spent a good chunk of his childhood at a private school in India, where he started going by Freddie. I'll always walk around like a Persian popinjay, <laughs> and no one's gonna stop me, honey. However, he didn't actually change his last name until around the time that Queen was founded. Luckily, his chosen moniker tends to roll off the tongue a little easier than the one he was born with. Royal Start Although their name is one of the most famous in rock history, Queen wasn't always called Queen. In their pupil state, when the band consisted of Brian May, Roger Taylor, and Tim Staffel, it was actually known as Smile. In 1970, however, Staffel left the group to join another band, the delightfully named Humpy Bong, and Smile's remaining members took on one of their fans as the lead singer, leading to a name change in the process. That fan was one Farouk Bolsara, and their new name was Queen. Feeling the Pressure under Pressure was the result of a winning combination of David Bowie, Hard Drugs, and Failure. In July 1981, Bowie went into the studio to record backup vocals for a Queen song called Cool Cat. Unable to get that particular song to work and despondent at their lack of success, Queen and Bowie fell into their backup plan, drinking wine and doing cocaine. Not a good thing to say in this country. <laughs> No, sorry, I didn't say that. As the evening progressed, something that could generously be referred to as creativity began to take hold. Queen and Bowie started messing around with a completely different song, written by Queen's drummer Roger Taylor and tentatively titled Feel Like. In a burst of creative hedonism, the song metamorphosed into something amazing. The bass line came together, the duet was improvised, and under pressure as we know it was born. A Kind of Science Brian May might not necessarily be a household name, but you'd struggle to find someone who isn't familiar with his work. As guitarist for Queen, he wrote Brighton Rock, Fat Bottom Girls, and We Will Rock You. That would be more than enough accomplishments for most people, but as the years grew on, he just kept going. May had dropped out of college back in the 70s to pursue a career in music. Although that panned out a little more than alright, he nonetheless decided to go back to school over 30 years later to wrap up his doctoral thesis in astrophysics. Since then, he's worked with NASA on a number of projects and even has an asteroid named after him. Amped Up Queen's bassist John Deacon has been a lot of things. On Queen's first album, for example, he was Deacon John, because the other band members thought it sounded more interesting. He's also a trained electronics engineer, and without him, Queen wouldn't sound the way they do. Deacon was the creator of the legendary DC Amp, the sound system that gave Queen their trademark orchestral tones. It's a piece of equipment that enthusiasts and engineers spent years trying to replicate, but with limited success. It wasn't until 2008, when a group of engineers tore the original machine apart, that they managed to find some semblance of an understanding of its inner workings. Even more impressively, Deacon created the original DC amp out of pieces he found in the trash. Bohemian Rhapsody with all of the glamour, fame, and jet-setting hedonism that Queen enjoyed throughout their career, it doesn't seem like much of a surprise that the band's story has been turned into a movie. But it's been a long road to getting a Queen movie made. The first shot at one was announced in 2010, with Sasha Baron Cohen attached to play Freddie Mercury. Three years later, and with nothing filmed, Cohen left the project, citing a number of reasons for exiting the film the most crucial being creative differences with the surviving band members. Cohen had wanted to make a gritty, adult-oriented look at the life and death of Freddie Mercury, while Brian May and Roger Taylor instead wanted a more family-friendly vibe, with half the movie focused on how Queen had kept going after Mercury's death. From there, the project continued to hit further speed bumps, burning through actors and directors before Rami Malek was eventually confirmed as the star and Brian Singer came in to direct. Can you go a bit higher? If I go any higher, only dogs will hear me. Try. After one last controversy, the firing of Singer and his replacement by Dexter Fletcher, Bohemian Rhapsody finally secured a November 2018 release. 
ZZ Top's music stands alone in classic rock, but the music isn't the only unique thing about this band. There are plenty of interesting details about ZZ Top you probably don't know. Here's the untold truth of the notorious bearded bandmates. Let's be honest, when you think of ZZ Top, the first thing that comes to mind is the mid-torso length beards these guys have been rocking since before many of us were born. Whether you can name a ZZ Top song or not, you still know the beards. Could you imagine ever seeing vocalist and guitarist Billy Gibbons or bassist Dusty Hill with a clean-shaven face or even a manageable scruff? Well, there was a time when that fresh face style was still their preferred look. Contrary to what you may expect, the band spent their first decade together without their iconic facial hair. Gibbons and Hill had a tendency to wear comparatively short beards. But one day, they both arrived at a meeting after having been on an extended vacation. Hill and Gibbons had forgotten to shave, and their beards had become pretty impressive. This was an entirely uncoordinated move, one that reportedly caused each of them not to recognize the other at first glance. Once the two bandmates realized they'd both independently grown some seriously distinctive facial hair, the beards were there to stay. It should be noted that the only member of the band who didn't rock a massive beard after that day was the one person whose name should have all but demanded it, drummer Frank Beard. Once ZZ Top's beards were hanging to their chest, they weren't going anywhere no matter what. Not only have they stayed, but Billy Gibbons and Dusty Hill seem to have thrown their razors away for good. They outright refused to cut their facial hair, and they've gotten plenty of high-dollar offers to do so. As Gibbons explained in an interview with Brave Words, razor manufacturer Gillette had once called the duo with a massive proposition. The company wanted Gibbons and Hill to be in one of their commercials. It would have been a big promotion for the company, having a group of international bearded superstars shilling their products. But Gillette isn't about growing one's beard long, it's about shaving it off. They offered the bearded pair $1 million to scrape off the scruff in front of a camera, but these chest-long beards were worth more than money to the band. They refused. It's just money. It's made up. The name ZZ Top seems to hold a bit of a mystery. In an interview Billy Gibbons did with KLRU, they talk about the myths flying around us of 2008. Gibbons' favorites is the rumor that says that they're named after the zigzag and top brand cigarette rolling papers. Gibbons has set the record straight quite a few times now, beginning in a book he published. The actual story, as the Ultimate Classic Rock describes, was actually quite simple. The band was sitting around their old apartment hangout when Gibbons looked up at the posters. ZZ Hill and B.B. King stood out as some of his favorite bands, so he mixed the two together but realized how much ZZ King sounded like B.B. King. To switch things up, and since B.B. King was at the top of the genre, Top became their stand-in for B.B. King. Throughout the band's first five albums, they'd been recording, touring, and playing shows non-stop. When the Worldwide Texas Tour began, things got even more stressful. They blew through nearly 100 shows in a year and a half, according to St. Mary's University. The band was getting burned out, and it really didn't help that the band had a road manager who was so good at his job. He was strict when it came to schedules and kept everything moving as it should. But with the high volume of work the guys in ZZ Top were expected to do, they could only take so much. When drummer Frank Beard spoke with the Boston Globe in 1980, he told the publication that they were the type of wild guys who did what they wanted whenever they wanted, but for the past six years they'd been herded this way and that by their management. It was taxing, so they stopped recording in 1977 and stopped touring shortly after. They returned in 1979 with the release of their sixth album, Degueo, but they didn't come back the same. When the band returned from their hiatus, the world looked at them differently. They were still the band from Texas, just not the same little old band from Texas that they were often referred to as. They still had their beards, they still had their style, but they also had a new way of conveying their bluesy rock style music into something more suitable for the soon to emerge MTV. They were truly rock stars now. The most recent lineup for ZZ Top includes Billy Gibbons on guitar and vocals, Dusty Hill on bass and vocals, and Frank Beard wailing away on the drums, but this wasn't how it started out. Gibbons was the only original member of the band ZZ Top that grew out of the remnants of his former band Moving Sidewalks. The sidewalks were dismantled when two of the bandmates were drafted into the army in 1969. The only member left besides Gibbons was drummer Dan Mitchell. The two weren't finished with music, so they got together with a bassist and produced the first single Salt Lick with a B-side Miller's Farm for the group that had now become known as ZZ Top. The band quickly added Billy Etheridge and switched out Mitchell for Frank Beard, and within the year they were offered a record contract, but Etheridge split. Beard then conscripted the help of his bassist from a former band, bringing Dusty Hill into the mix. From that point on, the band's lineup was set. ZZ Top maintained the same lineup from 1970 all the way until Dusty Hill's death in 2021. With over 50 years under the trio's belt, ZZ Top has become the longest-running band in the popular music world with a membership that didn't change. By the time the band finished their worldwide Texas tour, ZZ Top had a serious claim to rock and roll fame. They were now popular across the country, but the constant work that came with that fame wasn't always ideal, hence their hiatus. 
During their time away from music, and the short stint from 1977 to 1979 that the band took to rest and relax, bassist Dusty Hill took on a gig that some might see as unexpected. As Hill later asserted, he and the band needed to take a step back, not just from performing and touring, but from the entire rock and roll life in general. They'd seen too many musicians try to take on too much in their early years and burn out for good, and ZZ Top was striving for longevity. So what did Hill do with his time away? He worked at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. An old friend of his had been working there, and the job was just what Hill needed. The lifelong musician explains that he'd been on the road playing music since he was a young teenager and needed to get grounded with a relatively normal job. Frontman and guitarist of ZZ Top, Billy Gibbons, has one of those personalities that is larger than life. He's gritty, filled with rugged Texas charm, well-spoken in a way many might believe doesn't fit his image, and one of the biggest jokers in the history of rock and roll. All of these qualities together make him a perfectly distinctive character, and Fox Broadcasting Company took advantage of that when they cast him in a small role in the hit TV show Bones. Gibbons plays Angela's father on the show, and his character goes unnamed. There's a reason for this. As show creator Hart Hansen told the Chicago Tribune, Gibbons was playing a different version of himself. The whole time you watch him on screen, you have a hard time figuring out if he's meant to be a character or simply Gibbons, and his character was designed that way. Of course, this added sense of mystery has created more questions for fans. Many wondered if Gibbons was actually Angela actor Michaela Conlon's father here in the real world. He's not, but even some of his personal friends thought he was, and in true Gibbons style, he refused to correct them because he thought it was funnier that way. I don't know what that means. Well, if you do, you do. If you don't, you don't." Following a grueling recount during the 2000 election between Democrats and former Vice President Al Gore and former Governor of Texas George W. Bush, the Texan native was awarded the victory, becoming the 43rd President of the United States. Bush attained a second big win when he was re-elected in the 2004 presidential race. The presidential ball is usually a black or white tie affair, but Bush elected to have Ted Nugent and none other than ZZ Top headline the affair. Before the thing even kicked off, Nugent told the press that the concert was, quote, gonna be mayhem. Nugent ended up canceling, but ZZ Top showed up. This wasn't their first Bush rodeo. Following Bush's first presidential victory in 2000, according to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, ZZ Top played at the campaign's pre-inauguration party in Washington, D.C. According to Lone Star 92.5, while Bush was still the acting governor of Texas, he declared a state holiday on May 15, ZZ Top Day. But the holiday has actually been around a lot longer than that. In 1986, as the Sun Sentinel notes, the Texas House of Representatives declared the band to be official Texas heroes in a unanimous decision. They also declared ZZ Top Day for the first time, though back then it was August 27th. The decision put the musicians on a pedestal alongside state heroes such as Davy Crockett, Sam Houston, and Jim Bowie. Of course, these declarations took place while ZZ Top was in town to play three shows in Houston, so there's a good chance this was as much a publicity stunt as it was a serious honor. ZZ Top frontman Billy Gibbons is a seriously multi-talented individual. Besides both singing in his low, gravelly voice and shredding like a beast on the guitar, he's also a published writer. This really isn't a surprise if you've ever heard him speak or seen any of the written responses he sent into publications. Gibbons has a way with words. His first and only book, as Forbes describes, seems more like a subtle brag than anything else. Apparently, Gibbons is as knowledgeable about cars as he is about music equipment, both of which are equally portrayed subjects in Billy F. Gibbons' Rock and Roll Gearhead published in 2005. The book looks at guitar and car designs throughout the 50s and 60s, linking their progression together. The book has three sections. Cars and guitars make up two of them, and the third is all autobiographical, written in the entertaining and creative voice Gibbons uses while speaking at shows or in interviews. Over the past 20 years or so, ZZ Top bassist Dusty Hill has had at least a couple of serious ailments, and two of them seem to coincide with European tours. The first and more serious of them was when the musician was diagnosed with hepatitis C in 2000, causing ZZ Top to postpone their tour. Then in 2011, Hill suffered an acoustic neuroma, a benign tumor that grows in the inner ear and affects hearing. This again led to the cancellation of a European tour. During the afternoon of July 28, 2021, the official ZZ Top Facebook page delivered some heartbreaking news. Dusty Hill, beloved bassist and southern rock phenom, had passed away in his sleep earlier that morning. The band's message spoke about how much Gibbons and Beard, along with legions of ZZ Top fans, would miss him. ACDC has been making some of the best headbanging music since the 1970s. The untold truth of ACDC, however, is that the band had to overcome a changing lineup, the deaths of key musicians, and harsh criticism in their early days. Here's what you may not have known. 
1973, brothers Malcolm and Angus Young formed ACDC in Sydney, Australia. However, in an interview with Rolling Stone, Angus credited his brother with the whole reason for the band's beginning, saying, He's the founder of this whole thing, ACDC. At the very beginning of the band, I said to him, What are we going to do? He said, I know what we're going to do. We are going to do some rough, raw rock and roll. If it's got a beat and it swings, it's, yeah. it's basically rock and roll best. It's right. It be a- According to The New Yorker, Malcolm and Angus's older brother, George Young, also had a big influence on how the band's sound developed. George had been playing in a rock band called Easy Beats, which gained moderate success, but eventually left the band to work with his brothers. George mentored Malcolm and Angus and would become a producer on ACDC's albums. The band would go through a series of lineup changes in the 70s. After moving to Melbourne, both drummer Phil Rudd and bassist Mark Evans would join. Bon Scott, who had been working as the band's chauffeur, would become the new singer, replacing Dave Evans, who refused to go on stage. ACDC would release a series of albums during this time, from their debut LP High Voltage in 1976 to Let There Be Rock in 1977, among others. Bassist Cliff Williams would replace Mark Evans as the band secured their lineup. ACDC would release their debut LP, High Voltage, in 1976, and an alternative international version a year later of the same name, which would receive mixed reviews from critics. Rolling Stone's review would trash the album, and later appear in an article released decades later called 10 Classic Albums Rolling Stone Originally Panned. ACDC would keep putting out albums that would receive more favorable reviews, such as Let There Be Rock, and eventually Highway to Hell, which would go seven times platinum. The band would also expand its fan base on an international level and tour extensively while putting together its final lineup of Bon Scott, Malcolm Young, Angus Young, Cliff Williams, and Phil Rudd. ACDC's lead singer Bon Scott would unfortunately pass away at the age of 33 on February 19, 1980. After a night of drinking with friends, Scott was found dead the next day in his car after choking on his own vomit. There has been a debate as to what Scott's condition was the night before his passing. In Murray Englehart's band bio, ACDC Maximum Rock and Roll, the band's original drummer, Colin Burgess, felt something was up. As Burgess recalled, Scott was leaving and he was all right, like he wasn't drunk at all. And we went home and the next day he's dead. To me, it's just a really, really strange thing. In the book Bond, The Last Highway, author Jesse Fink spoke with Roy Allen, one of Scott's friends, who said that Scott was planning on leaving the band and quitting drinking back in 1979. Allen would recall Scott allegedly saying, Roy, I want to come to Texas. I'm coming into a good bit of money soon. I've had it. The living on the road, the shows, the drinking. I'm ready to leave the band. I've got to get out. It's all killing me, and I know it. After Bon Scott passed away, ACDC was faced with a hard decision. Should they continue or end the band? Months later, ACDC would push forward, and after a strange set of circumstances, Brian Johnson would end up becoming their new singer. According to an interview with the New York Post, Johnson said Bon Scott first saw him perform while suffering from appendicitis. Johnson recalled, I went down on my side, kicking and going, ooh, but I kept on singing. Apparently, Bond later told the boys, I saw this guy Brian Johnson sing, and he was great. He was on the floor, kicking and screaming. What an act. Of course, it wasn't an act. I was really ill. Angus and Malcolm remembered the story Scott told them and added Johnson to a list of possible singers. After a great audition, Johnson would get the gig and the band would continue working on their album, Back in Black. Remember that specifically because it was a big moment in my life. Once hired, Johnson would be asked to write lyrics to a riff the band was working on, saying, They had a very basic riff, and they said, We were thinking of calling it Shook Me All Night Long. I sat down that night with this blank piece of paper, and within about 15 minutes, I had this song written. Back in Black would become the band's best-selling album and the second best-selling album ever, right behind Michael Jackson's Thriller. Finally, ACDC would tribute the album to their fallen friend and bandmate, Bon Scott. ACDC's career would keep going uphill as they would release more top-selling albums and tour larger venues. In 1991, while promoting their album The Razor's Edge, the band would be selected to play at a concert with one of the biggest crowds on record. Just before the fall of the Soviet Union, Russia held a heavy metal concert featuring ACDC, Pantera, and Metallica. The concert would eventually draw over 1.5 million people and would help bring more Western music to the country. The band would also lend their music to film soundtracks and even recorded a song specifically for the film The Last Action Hero called Big Gun. 
After the release of 1990's The Razor's Edge, ACDC would release Ball Breaker in 1995 and Stiff Upper Lip in 2000. In 2003, the band was inducted by Steven Tyler into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In 2014, Malcolm Young announced that he'd been diagnosed with dementia and would be leaving the band for good to take care of himself. Filling in for Malcolm would be none other than his nephew, Stevie Young. Stevie subbed in for Malcolm in 1988 while on tour, and he fit seamlessly into the band in 2014. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Angus had this to say, Stevie has done a great job because he grew up playing that style of music, the same as Malcolm. Only three years later, however, Malcolm Young would pass away. His death came just three weeks after the death of Young's older brother, producer and mentor George Young. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Angus spoke lovingly about his two brothers, telling the magazine, my brother George was a very big part of ACDC, especially in our early years. George and Malcolm were always the two guys I relied on. It didn't matter if we were in a studio or wherever. I always asked for their advice on whatever I was doing. In 2015, things took another dark turn for the band. According to the New York Daily News, ACDC's drummer Phil Rudd was arrested and sentenced to eight months of home detention for trying to have his former personal assistant killed as well as for possession of drugs. Rudd had just released a solo album called Head Job, which didn't do well in sales and felt like it was everyone's fault but his own. Rudd was so mad that he fired almost all his staff and wanted his former personal assistant, quote, taken out, as per Rolling Stone. The dirty deed would not be done cheap. Rudd phoned an unnamed Australian associate and offered them $200,000, a car, a motorbike, or a house in exchange for the hit. The day after the call, Rudd called his former assistant and said, quote, I'm going to come over and kill you. The victim then phoned authorities and said he was fearful for his safety, which led to the police showing up at Rudd's house. Police also found 91 grams of marijuana stashed throughout Rudd's house, as well as methamphetamine. Drummer Chris Slade would fill in while Rudd would deal with his legal battles. Between 2015 and 2016, Brian Johnson began noticing issues with his hearing. The singer told Rolling Stone, I couldn't hear the tone of the guitars at all. It was a horrible kind of deafness. I was literally getting by on muscle memory and mouth shapes. I was starting to feel really bad about the performances in front of the boys, in front of the audience. It was crippling. ACDC tried to continue with Johnson, who did the best he could, but eventually his doctors warned that he could go deaf. Johnson would be forced to leave, and the band would again find itself in search of a new singer. In 2019, in an interview with Dan Rather, Johnson would explain what it was like having to leave the band, saying, It's like being shot on the battlefield. It's just your turn. I'll be quite honest with you. I went in my office and buried my head in a bottle of whiskey. Good whiskey. ACDC started looking for a new singer with a strong enough voice and stage presence to fill in for Brian Johnson. Thankfully, they had a friend from another band who was ready to help out. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Angus said, There was a list of people that might fill in. Out of the blue, Axl Rose contacted and said he could help out, which was very good. With Rose filling in for Johnson, the band was able to finish out the rest of their 2016 Rocker Bust tour. While Axl Rose was chosen as the band's new lead, there was another popular musician who almost ended up as ACDC's new singer. In an interview with Classic Rock magazine, Irish singer of Blackwater Conspiracy, Phil Connellyan said he'd auditioned for the band just before the role was offered to Rose. Connellyan said in the interview, Long story short, he tells me that Brian has had to step away from ACDC for medical reasons and that guitarist Angus Young would like me to come over to the US for a bit of a jam. Would I be interested? After all was said and done, the band went with Rose. I um, yeah, want to do right by the band and the fans. However, with a little luck and help from some doctors, Brian Johnson would return, along with drummer Phil Rudd and bassist Cliff Williams, who took a break from the band. Doctors were able to create a device that would help Johnson with hearing so he could sing. Following the good news, ACDC would plan to tour again and work on a new album. ACDC would go on to record Power Up between 2018 and 2019. The recording process was very close to all the members of ACDC, especially Angus, who told Rolling Stone, This record is pretty much a dedication to Malcolm, my brother. It's a tribute for him like Back in Black was a tribute to Bon Scott. Power Up would be the first album the band would work on without Malcolm. During the recording process, however, the iconic guitarist's presence would be felt by all members. In an interview with Rolling Stone, Brian Johnson had this to say, Malcolm was always there. As Angus would say, the band was his idea. Everything in it ran through him. He was always there, and your minds are just your thoughts. I still see him in my own way. I still think about him. 
Power Up was produced by Brendan O'Brien, who worked on ACDC's two previous albums. Due to COVID-19, the band had to stop their plans of touring in 2020, but whenever the pandemic clears up, they hope to return. Neil Young is a world-renowned musician who started his career way back in the 60s, and he's still going strong today. But despite his longevity, much of his life has remained in the dark to the public at large. Neil Young's not the only famous individual in his family. He was born on November 12, 1945, in Toronto, Canada, to Edna and Scott Young, the latter of whom was one of the most distinguished sports journalists in Canadian history. He started his journalism career with the Winnipeg Free Press before moving on to the Canadian Press, where he worked from 1942 to 1943 as a war correspondent in London during World War II. He then went on to serve in the Royal Canadian Naval Volunteer reserves for the rest of the war. After going on to spend three years as the assistant editor at Maclean's magazine, he spent the next three decades as a popular sports journalist, columnist, and commentator for the Toronto Globe and Mail, the Toronto Telegram, and the CBC. Scott Young was also a successful author and historian, as he published a number of nonfiction books, short stories, and novels, including Neil and Me, a 1984 biography about his son. He also gave Neil his first music musical instrument, a ukulele. In 1988, Scott Young was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame as a journalist. He died in June 2005 at the age of 87. Neil Young's music career has taken him through many different genres, from soft folk and country to blues and grunge rock. One genre he's not usually associated with is R&B, but in fact, he was actually once a member of an R&B group. The Mina Birds, early in his career. That group was fronted by a young Rick James, and they were on their way to being signed by the legendary Motown Records. Unfortunately, James was on the run from the law, as he was in Canada to avoid being drafted into the United States Navy. With a string of multiple low-level convictions to his name, and not wanting to fight in the Vietnam War, James fled north. The Mina Birds released two singles that caught the attention of Motown, which gave the group a deal and a cash advance. Alas, the money disappeared when their manager got a hold of it, so the band fired him. But in retaliation, he informed the authorities and Motown of James's status. James was soon taken into custody by the Navy. Motown cut ties and the group was over. Young later spoke with Mojo Magazine about his musical direction following the breakup. As he noted, I moved instead towards acoustic music and immediately became very introspective and musically inward. That's the beginning of that whole side of my music. The 1969 Woodstock Music Festival has a reputation as the apex of the counterculture movement of the era. Among the lineup was one of Neil Young's bands, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. CSNY was still in their infancy when they played Woodstock. Each member had been successful in previous bands, but Woodstock was just the second time they played together as a group for any audience. Nevertheless, their set went off without a hitch during the early morning hours of Monday, August 18th. But despite that success, Young doesn't make any kind of appearance during the performance. Even his name is redacted when the band is introduced. He told Howard Stern that he was annoyed that the cameramen were up in his face while he was performing, rather than shooting from a distance. They didn't have to be right there. That was stupid. They didn't have to be on the stage. Their cameras. Hello? <laughs> Ironically enough, CSNY would go on to cover Joni Mitchell's song about the festival, also called Woodstock, on their 1970 album, Deja Vu. Young's face at Woodstock was eventually seen in a new documentary about the festival that was released in 2019. Many songwriters have drawn inspiration from their own lives, and Neil Young is no exception. But one of his most well-known songs, The Needle and the Damage Done, from the 1972 album Harvest, has a particularly dark origin story. It's about Danny Witten, a former friend and bandmate of Young's. Witten was an original member of Crazy Horse, which would eventually become Young's backing band. But by the beginning of the 70s, Witten had become heavily addicted to heroin, which persisted despite multiple interventions. Young also ultimately fired Witten after a bad session during which he couldn't even hold his guitar. He gave his friend $50 for rehab and a plane ticket back to Los Angeles. In 1972, Witten would fatally overdose on alcohol and Valium shortly after reaching LA. Young later spoke of his friend's death by confessing, 
I felt responsible, but really there was nothing I could do. I mean, he was responsible, but I thought I was for a long time. Danny just wasn't happy. It just all came down on him. He was engulfed by this drug. That was too bad, because Danny had a lot to give. Young has written a number of protest songs influenced by his political leanings. One of the most famous, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young's Ohio, was inspired by a real-life tragedy. On May 4, 1970, National Guardsmen fired live ammunition into a crowd of anti-war protesters on the campus of Kent State University. A few days later, David Crosby handed Young a copy of Life magazine that featured an image of the gruesome aftermath. Young then disappeared for a few hours into the woods and returned with the lyrics written and studio time booked. Despite being censored by many stations for its political lyrics, Ohio became a top 20 hit and an anti-war anthem. I wanted to do this song, I don't mean it to be a downer, but uh, one of my songs, what can I tell you? Young's protest music spans decades. His 1989 hit, Rockin' in the Free World, was a harsh critique of the George H.W. Bush administration and rising political tensions in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Young also later showed his disdain for the second Bush president when in 2006 he released the album Living with War, which made clear his thoughts about George W. Bush and the war on terror. Neil Young has had a complicated relationship with his bandmates over the years. His desire to be a solo artist led to his split with Buffalo Springfield, but it also accidentally created the supergroup Crosby, Stills, and Nash. When Young refused to perform at the Monterey Pop Festival with Buffalo Springfield, Stephen Stills asked David Crosby to fill in, and the two of them hit it off. They were then introduced to Graham Nash, and they formed a trio. After their first album in 1969, Atlantic Records president Ahmet Ertegun pushed them to add Young to the band. Following an album and two tours as a member of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Young left to continue his solo career in 1970. Three years later, Young called Nash and Crosby to join him on a tour, and soon enough all four men were together again. But when the band decided to make a new album, Young disappeared. A year later, Young called Stills, desiring to work on a CSNY album, but Nash and Crosby were unable to join due to contractual reasons. Despite Crosby and Nash recording vocals, Young and Stills cut their contributions, creating a Stills and Young duo album and angering their old bandmates. And like clockwork, while touring, Young decided to leave, forcing Stills to finish the tour alone. Neil Young and Leonard Skinner both reached the peaks of their popularity in the 1970s. They also had a publicly antagonistic relationship towards each other. Two of Young's most popular songs, Southern Man and Alabama, both took aim at racism in the American South. These tunes caught the ear of Ronnie Van Sant, Skinner's lead singer and songwriter. He was a fan of Young's, but he felt that his songs painted the South with too broad a brush. His response was Sweet Home Alabama which called out Young by name. Despite what seemed to be evidence of a feud, in reality, these two acts were apparently on good terms with each other. Van Zant, who passed away in a plane crash in 1977, reportedly wrote his response as a joke, and Young had even penned the song Powderfinger for Skinner to record, and the surviving members of Skinner have claimed that there was no feud. Back when Neil Young was a teenage traveling musician, the Beatles made their way to the United States and launched the musical counterculture of the 60s. In many ways, the Fab Four paved the way for Young and plenty of others. At the same time, two Beatles, John Lennon and George Harrison, were very critical of Young and his music. In a 1980 Playboy interview, Lennon took exception with what he believed was the message in Young's 1977 song, Hey Hey My My Into the Black. Lennon said, I hate it. It's better to fade away like an old soldier than to burn out. If he was talking about burning out like Sid Vicious, forget it. I don't appreciate the worship of dead Sid Vicious. Or of dead James Dean. Or dead John Wayne. No, thank you. I'll take the living and the healthy. Lennon died three months after the interview. Young responded to the criticism two years later, as he explained that he was referring to the spirit of rock and roll and not specific individuals. Lennon's criticism can be chalked up to mixed messages, but it's a little more clear-cut when it comes to what George Harrison had to say. During a studio session in 1992, Harrison told singer-songwriter Bob Geldof, I'm not a Neil Young fan. And then, when Geldof began to wax poetic about Young's guitar playing, Harrison insisted, I hate it. Yeah, I can't stand it. It's hard to argue with the Beatle, although millions of Neil Young fans probably would. 
Neil Young has never been shy about sharing his political opinions. He's also spent a lot of time on the front lines of many social movements, from his teen years to today. For example, in 1985, he organized the benefit concert, Farm Aid, along with John Mellencamp and Willie Nelson. Then, in 2020, Young officially became a citizen of the United States and he used the movement to lambaste President Donald Trump. During Trump's 2016 presidential campaign, he had played Young's Rockin' in the Free World. Despite the song being a critique of the first Bush administration, Young demanded that Trump not use his song, and after becoming a citizen, he penned an open letter with the first line declaring, You are a disgrace to my country. Young has also been critical of the other side of the aisle. In 2016, he called on then-President Barack Obama to step in during the Dakota Access pipeline protests at the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. The entire world needs a reset. Early in his life, Neil Young suffered from various health issues. At the age of six, he was unable to walk for a time because of the effects of type 1 diabetes, epilepsy, and polio. He would recover, but these issues would follow him for the rest of his life. And he's not the only in his family with health troubles. Both of his sons, Zeke and Ben, suffer from severe cases of cerebral palsy. Ben was unable to attend area schools because they weren't equipped to handle his condition. So in 1986, Neil and his wife at the time, Peggy, founded the Bridge School to help kids like Ben. Ben has taught me that you, you never give up. You can't uh, say, this is too hard can't be too hard. Yeah. Young met Peggy back in 1974, and they got married in 1978, which was Young's second marriage. They were together for decades, but they ultimately divorced in 2014, and Peggy passed away from cancer on New Year's Day 2019. After the divorce, Young began a relationship with actress Daryl Hannah, and they got married in secret in 2018. They revealed their relationship status to the world when Young referred to Hannah as his wife in a social media post supporting gun control legislation. In the late 60s and early 70s, Creedence Clearwater Revival was one of the most popular bands in America. The band released a slew of classic hits in those few short years before breaking up in 1972. This is the untold truth of CCR. Creedence Clearwater Revival was the perfect vehicle for the singing, songwriting, and guitar playing of John Fogarty. But the band can trace its origins to groups formed by a different member of the family, John's older brother, Tom Fogarty. In the 1950s, high schooler Tom Fogarty formed a band called Spiderweb and the Insects. The group signed a deal with Delphi Records, but never actually recorded anything and broke up in 1959. Meanwhile, John Fogarty had formed his own group, the Blue Velvets, along with bassist Stu Cook and drummer Doug Clifford. While still fronting Spiderweb and the Insects, Tom Fogarty would occasionally play gigs with the Blue Velvets. However, after his primary band split, the Blue Velvets officially absorbed Tom Fogarty, and he became the lead singer of the band, which was rebranded as Tommy Fogarty and the Blue Velvets. This iteration recorded a handful of singles in 1961 and 1962, printed in very small runs, which didn't bring the band any success. By the mid-1960s, and after changing its name once more to the Gollywogs, the foursome of two Fogarty's Cook and Clifford had released six singles, all of them co-written by John and Tom, who also split vocal duties. By the time the group would reach its final stage as Creedence Clearwater Revival, Tom Fogarty's vocal and songwriting contributions had diminished to the point of virtual non-existence. When John Fogarty and his Swamp Rocking cohorts came up in the 1960s, it was more fashionable for the mainstream bands to have short and direct names, monikers like The Who, The Rolling Stones, and The Kinks. A name like Creedence Clearwater Revival would suggest that the band would sound like grandly named psychedelic groups such as Jefferson Airplane or the 13th Floor Elevators. Those three words just sound like they belong together, so they must have some kind of unifying meaning, right? Not really. When the band signed to Fantasy Records, it was still called the Gollywogs, which label had Saul Zantz loathed, calling it, quote, a stupid name. To generate a new name, Zantz came up with a list of 10 ideas and then sent the band off to do the same, after which they'd find one they agreed on. Some early contenders were Deep Bottle Blue, Muddy Rabbit, and Creedence New Ball and the Ruby. The latter was suggested by guitarist Tom Fogarty, based on the name of a friend. The rest of the Gollywogs went to work improving on Fogarty's idea, adding an extra E to get Credence and then adding clear water, taken from an ad for Olympia Beer purporting that the product contains cool, clear water. It's the water of Tom Water that gives Olympia its perfect blend of flavor and refreshment. Then frontman John Fogarty added Revival because he felt like the band was getting a new lease on life with its record deal. Creedence Clearwater Revival sound, a mixture of grimy hard rock, blues, folk, and Gulf Coast styles, has a name, Swamp Rock, because it sounds like the band comes straight out of Louisiana. 
That Louisiana flavor is all over Credence's songs, explicitly so on the song Born on the Bayou, but Fogarty is singing from the point of view of a character, because neither he nor anyone else in Credence Clearwater Revival was born or raised anywhere near the American Southeast. John and Tom Fogarty both hail from the Berkeley area of California. Drummer Doug Clifford was born in nearby Palo Alto, and bassist Stu Cook is from Oakland. The band members knew each other because they'd all attended El Cerrito High School in California. Part of the reason why the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969 was such a monumental event to the baby boomer generation was because nearly every major rock act of the era took the stage over the course of the weekend. Among the bands who played for an audience of 400,000 people were Santana, Jimi Hendrix, The Who, and Joe Cocker. All those acts were prominently featured in the Woodstock documentary and its live recorded soundtrack, which helped solidify the importance of the event and the collective consciousness. Creedence Clearwater Revival also played the festival, but the band's presence there has often been forgotten and overlooked. Ironically, Woodstock may not have become a concert of great magnitude without Creedence. Once a chart-topping band agreed to be a headliner, a slew of other acts signed up too. The reason why Credence's Woodstock set is lost to history is because it wasn't initially or conclusively preserved. Left out of the Woodstock documentary and soundtrack record at the behest of frontman John Fogarty, Fogarty told the Los Angeles Times that when the band went on to play, it was already 2.30 in the morning. Everybody was running late, of course. Right. Hippies had been putting on this thing. Fogarty added that despite playing a great set, there was almost no reaction from the audience since most of the crowd was asleep. Fogarty didn't want the band's performance to be remembered, so he kept CCR out of the Oscar-winning Woodstock documentary. When one thinks about the top-selling and most successful musicians of all time, names like The Beatles, Elvis Presley, and Michael Jackson likely come to mind. Indeed, all those acts scored at least a dozen number one hits each and ranked at or near the top of the Recording Industry Association of America's list of musicians who sold the most albums. And then there's CCR. Perhaps because their time in the spotlight was a relatively brief four years, or because they're so explicitly associated with the late 60s and early 70s sound, Creedence Clearwater Revival can be overlooked when discussing the pantheon of pop rock superstars. However, in 1970, the best-selling band on the planet was Creedence Clearwater Revival, which moved more LPs than heavyweights like The Beatles and Led Zeppelin. But there's another reason they're overlooked. Despite holding the all-time record for the most songs to peak at number two on the charts, they never had a number one hit. According to Slate, the group hit number two on the Billboard Hot 100 five times. Those almost chart toppers, Proud Mary, Green River, Bad Moon Rising, Traveling Band, and Looking Out My Back Door. In 1970, Creedence Clearwater Revival's John Fogarty-written Traveling Band was a smash hit, peaking at, of course, number two on the Billboard Hot 100. It was more of what CCR did best, hard rock with wailing vocals laced with elements of southeastern U.S. folk styles. The song's sound was also a bridge between the straightforward rock of the 50s and the heavy metal that would come of age in the 70s. Fogarty had a deep appreciation of and was extremely influenced by the old-time rock and roll performed by southern musicians, telling Rolling Stone, Little Richard was the greatest rock and roll singer of all time. I was a kid when his records were coming out, so I got to experience them in real time. Unfortunately, according to Forbes, Little Richard was paid the egregiously low sum of $50 by Specialty Records for the rights to those rock and roll blueprint songs like Tutti Frutti and Good Golly Miss Molly. And unfortunately for Creedence Clearwater Revival, Specialty took the band to court in October 1971, alleging that CCR's Little Richard-inspired traveling band was more like a Little Richard ripoff, specifically of Good Golly Miss Molly. In the end, Specialty Records eventually dropped the case. Of the original members of Creedence Clearwater Revival who have had solo careers, John Fogarty has been the most successful, scoring hit singles like Jambalaya on the Bayou, The Man Down the Road, and Center Field, a baseball stadium standard. But he wasn't the first member of the extremely successful CCR to leave the band to go it alone. That would be rhythm guitarist and his brother, Tom Fogarty. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, John's tight and unrelenting creative control over the band led to Tom's exit. After recording the album Pendulum, Tom Fogarty departed Credence in 1971 and, over the next 10 years, released five solo albums that didn't yield any hit singles. Meanwhile, back in the depleted Credence Clearwater Revival, John Fogarty took his brother's motivations to heart and let the other two band members, Stu Cook and Doug Clifford, write and sing the majority of the songs on the next album, Mardi Gras. Unlike the group's previous albums, Mardi Gras didn't go platinum. After one final tour as a three-man band, Credence split up in 1972. After Creedence Clearwater Revival split up professionally, they diverted personally too, and bitterly at that. John Fogarty loathed and resented Fantasy Records and its boss Saul Zantz for placing him and his bandmates under what he thought were unfair and exploitative contracts. Fogarty's negative feelings spilled over to the rest of the CCR, whom he felt him and the band betrayed because they'd sold their right to vote on band decisions to Zantz. 
It's old Opie Radio. And that was obviously why Saul felt he could now do anything he wanted with Creedence music. The freeze-out continued for years, and the band reunited as Creedence Clearwater Revival just once, but not in a professional setting to record music or play for fans. The four members performed together in 1980 at Tom Fogarty's wedding, according to AllMusic. Tom Fogarty died in 1990, and several years later, CCR members Doug Clifford and Stu Cook teamed up to hit the road as Creedence Clearwater Revisited. John Fogarty sued the duo in 1996 because he controlled the rights to the name Creedence Clearwater Revival and didn't authorize this use. In 2001, the sides reached an agreement. Clifford and Cook would pay Fogarty a royalty any time they used the revisited name. They paid that fee up until 2011 when Fogarty violated the terms of the settlement by disparaging the latter-day Creedence variant in interviews. In the midst of all the tragedy and legal battling that descended on the world of Creedence Clearwater Revival in the 1990s, the surviving members of the band were given more than one opportunity to leave the past in the past, get back together, and play their beloved songs for a large and appreciative crowd. John Fogarty personally prevented both CCR reunion gigs from happening. After Bill Clinton became the first member of the Baby Boomer generation to be elected President of the United States, organizers of his inauguration celebration approached the members of Creedence Clearwater Revival about performing at the January 1993 event. Fogarty gave a hard pass, writing in his memoir, Fortunate Son. I said, I'm not playing as a band with Creedence. I don't play with those guys. We will never play as a band again. Later in 1993, the three living members of CCR at least breathed the same air together when the group was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It's customary for newly enshrined acts to perform, even if they've broken up, so Fogarty took the stage with Robbie Robertson and Bruce Springsteen. He'd arranged to prevent Cook and Clifford from joining him. Since the 1980s and 1990s, when Hollywood ramped up its examination and depictions of the Vietnam War, filmmakers have frequently used a particular trick to let audiences know that a scene takes place during that bloody military conflict and in the late 1960s. The soundtrack blares Creedence Clearwater Revival's Fortunate Son. CCR's John Fogarty wrote the song in 1969 as a protest against the Vietnam War, calling out the offspring of the connected and wealthy who could pull some strings to get a draft deferment and avoid dangerous combat duty. That sentiment is made pretty clear in the song, which means it can instantly convey to audiences that the filmmaker's point of view is decidedly anti-war. Fortunate Son has been used to score Vietnam War-focused sequences in movies like Forrest Gump, Moonwalkers, Prefontaine, numerous documentaries about the era, as well as on the animated TV shows Family Guy and American Dad. And that doesn't even include the 60s-centric or Vietnam War films that used other Creedence Clearwater Revival songs. Rock on, CCR! George Harrison is remembered as the quiet Beatle, but he was so much more than that. From a successful solo career to holding a major benefit concert to becoming a movie producer, he accomplished quite a lot during his life and career. This is the untold truth of George Harrison. Most Beatles songs were written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, but Harrison managed to chime in with his own efforts every once in a while. The first song he penned for the band was Don't Bother Me, which was featured on their sophomore LP with The Beatles. This track has an interesting backstory as it was written during a bout of illness. During a tour in 1963, Harrison came down with a bug. While quarantining himself in his hotel room, he lay in bed with his guitar and started strumming to pass the time. He then decided that he would write a song as an exercise to find out if he could pull it off, and sure enough, he accomplished his goal. In retrospect, Harrison doesn't exactly hold Don't Bother Me in the highest esteem. As he later recalled, I didn't think it was a particularly good song. Nevertheless, it was an important step in his musical journey, as he also noted, but at least it showed me that all I needed to do was keep on writing and maybe eventually I would write something good. Harrison is well known for his affinity for the sitar, a stringed instrument that originated in the Indian subcontinent. He first picked it up after seeing one on the set of the Beatles' 1965 film Help. He famously played it in the Beatles' 1965 song Norwegian Wood, This Bird Has Flown, off their album Rubber Soul. The song did well on the charts, but famous sitar player Ravi Shankar was unimpressed with Harrison's simplistic playing, which just echoed the main melody. As he reportedly said, if George Harrison wants to play the sitar, why does he not learn it properly? Harrison and Shankar eventually crossed paths, and the two of them hit it off immediately. Shankar offered to instruct Harrison, who gladly accepted. Soon enough, he was learning not only about the proper playing techniques, but also the instrument's spiritual significance in Indian culture. When the rest of the world moved past the fad of Indian influences on Western music, Harrison remained invested in Eastern music. He even helped to finance and distribute Raga, a 1971 documentary about Shankar's life. The thing that really blew me away was because I thought, well, he's just such an amazing player. George Harrison's interest in the sitar developed during a time of great strife in South Asia. After a long period of British colonialism, the Indian subcontinent was divided into the two independent nations of India and Pakistan in 1947. 
Subsequently, Pakistan was split into two territories, one on each side of India, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, the latter of which was where the government was based. In March 1971, East Pakistan declared independence as the nation Bangladesh. In response, West Pakistan began a vicious military genocide, killing between 300,000 and 3 million Bengali and forcing millions of refugees to migrate to India. Ravi Shankar, a Bengali, was eager to help with the situation. He asked Harrison if he would be interested in planning a concert to raise funds for the refugees, and Harrison jumped on board. The concert for Bangladesh, which was held at Madison Square Garden on August 1, 1971, was the first ever benefit concert of its scale. It was a star-studded affair, featuring such acts as Bob Dylan, Ringo Starr, Leon Russell, Billy Preston, Eric Clapton, Badfinger, and of course, Sean Carr and Harrison. The show raised almost $250,000, all of which was donated to UNICEF. When asked afterward why he'd gotten involved with the Bengali cause, Harrison answered simply, because I was asked by a friend if I would help. Everybody knew the name of Bangladesh all over the world. George Harrison wasn't just a musician. He also founded a production company, Handmade Films, along with his business manager, Dennis O'Brien. The company got its start with quite the iconic project, the 1979 comedy classic Monty Python's Life of Brian. Harrison wasn't involved with the movie from its very beginning, though. At first, it was an EMI production, but that company's chairman, Lord Delfont, was reportedly so appalled by the screenplay that he completely removed himself from the endeavor, leaving the Pythons to finance the film themselves. So Python member Eric Idle called up Harrison, a friend of his, to see if he would be interested in helping out. Harrison was a major fan of the Pythons' comedy, so he then consulted with O'Brien, who was all for it. Harrison had to remortgage his mansion to make the film, but that was a small price to pay in order to be able to watch a new Monty Python movie on the big screen. Handmade also released several films that are now considered British cinema classics, including The Long Good Friday, Time Bandits, and With Nail and I. Many of these movies featured first-time directors or actors who were just starting out, and many who had also been dropped by other studios. As Harrison once professed, if something's really good, it deserves to be made. He seemed truly committed to this philosophy as he produced 23 titles during his time with the company. Even before his production work on Life of Brian, Harrison was close with the Monty Python crew. In fact, he even made a cameo on the 1975 Christmas special of Eric Idle's TV program Rutland Weekend Television. In the episode, he played himself, but with a twist. He sports a pirate hat, an eye patch, a parrot on his shoulder, and a peg leg, insisting that his name is Pirate Bob. Throughout the show, he interrupts various sketches with the intention of showing off his marvelous acting skills. But time and again, Idle emphasizes that he just wants Harrison to be himself. No pirate sketch down here, see? A no pirate sketch? No. I will help you then. At the end of the episode, Harrison finally appears without the pirate garb, guitar in hand. He strums out the beginning of his hit single, My Sweet Lord, then over the song's gentle opening chords, he barks, I like to be a pirate, a pirate's life for me. And then what follows is a rousing performance of an original sea shanty written by Harrison and Idol. George Harrison's recording contract with EIM, which had been orchestrated by Brian Epstein during his time with the Beatles, ended in 1976. Harrison prepared for the next chapter in his musical career in advance by creating his own label, Dark Horse Records, in 1974. The artists that Harrison signed to the label included the likes of Ravi Shankar, the band Attitudes, the vocal duo Splinter, and R&B group The Stair Steps. Harrison himself also recorded six albums on Dark Horse from 1976 to 1992. Many of the songs on these albums were also featured in movie productions by handmade films. Today, Dark Horse has made a full-circle journey, having merged with EMI Parlophone in 2002. It's now led by George's son Danny, as well as manager David Zonshine. It recently teamed up with BMG to release new recordings from George Harrison's back catalogs, as well as the back catalogs of Joe Strummer and Tom Petty. You might know that George Harrison played on the Beatles song Drive My Car, but did you know that he was also a massive auto enthusiast? It's true, as he bought and sold cars with such enthusiasm that nobody knows exactly how many he ever owned. According to a 2020 GQ profile, his most notable automobiles included a green Ford Anglia 105E that served as his first car, a black Jaguar E-Type that Brian Epstein reportedly gave him for his 21st birthday, a white 1964 Aston Martin DB5, and last but not least, the psychedelically decorated Austin Mini Cooper that was featured in the Beatles film Magical Mystery Tour. Harrison didn't just show off his vehicular love by collecting cars, he was also a fan of Formula One racing, to the extent that he once spent months following the Formula One World Championship across the globe. He even wrote a song about his passion for racing, 1979's Faster, whose title he took from the diary of race car driver Jackie Stewart. The song features a recording of the engines at the start of the 1979 British Grand Prix. It was released as a single to raise money for the Gunnar Nielsen Cancer Fund, which was founded in honor of a Swedish driver who passed away from cancer in 1978. 
George Harrison was often referred to as the quiet Beatle, but true fans know that he was no shrinking violet. In fact, he was known for his silly sense of humor, including his knack for clever one-liners. During the Beatles' early days, producer George Martin made some criticisms and asked the band if there was anything they didn't like about a particular track. So Harrison quipped, "'Well, for a start, I don't like your tie.'" Harrison was also fond of pranks, and perhaps his most legendary exploit occurred when he decided to pull one over on Phil Collins. When the former Genesis frontman was 19, he was invited to play conga drums for Harrison's 1970 album All Things Must Pass. But upon the album's release, Collins realized that none of his tracks were incorporated into the final product. Twenty years later, Collins ran into Harrison and asked him why he hadn't been featured. Harrison cast the blame onto his producer Phil Spector, but offered to send Collins the master tapes of the session. When Collins received them, he was shocked to hear terrible drum playing, along with Harrison's voice saying, "'Get rid of the lad on the congas, he's crap!' Collins called Harrison to say that he hadn't realized he'd played so poorly at the time. He also noted that the tape revealed that Harrison, not Spectre, had rejected his drumming. Harrison apologized, and the two moved on, swiftly changing the topic. But Harrison eventually burst out laughing and admitted that he fooled Collins. In actuality, the tapes were fake, as Harrison had hired a band to re-record the song with the deliberate inclusion of some truly terrible conga playing. The moment ended in good spirits, with Harrison assuring Collins that the real sessions had sounded great. George Harrison and his family had quite the scare when an intruder named Michael Abram broke into their mansion in Oxfordshire. At around 3.20 a.m., Harrison's wife Olivia was awakened by the sound of glass shattering. Upon realizing that someone had entered the premises, she phoned the police while George went downstairs to investigate. He discovered that a kitchen window had been broken, as had his statue of St. George and the Dragon. He then came face to face with Abram, who was carrying both a knife and a sword taken from the statue. Harrison chanted Harry Krishna, Harry Krishna as a distraction tactic, but that didn't stop Abram from charging at him and stabbing him in the chest. Abram apparently believed that Harrison had possessed him and that he was on a mission from God to kill the musician. Despite the significant wounds, Harrison managed to survive. I've got a son who needs a father, so I have to stick around for him. George Harrison loved his family, music, Eastern spirituality, and fast cars. Unfortunately, he was also fond of smoking cigarettes, which may have cut his life short. In 1998, he developed throat cancer, which initially went into remission after he underwent treatment. But then in 2001, the cancer recurred. Harrison then went in for lung surgery, but doctors soon discovered that the cancer had spread to his brain. On November 29th of that year, he passed away at the age of 58 in the home of a friend with his wife Olivia and his son Danny by his side. His family released a statement that read, We are deeply touched by the outpouring of love and compassion from around the world. The profound beauty of George's passing, of his awakening from this dream, was no surprise to those of us who knew how he longed to be with God. There's no denying that Sir Elton John is one of the most recognizable musicians alive, and he's come a long way from Reginald Kenneth Dwight to Rocket Man. Here's the story of this legendary rock star. Elton John is not a person to shy away from conflict, and even his closest family members aren't safe from the drama. According to People magazine, he even had a nasty eight-year feud with his own mother, Sheila Fairbrother. Their relationship took a nasty bump in June 2008 when John fired two longtime employees with close ties to his mother. Fairbrother wasn't too amused when her son proceeded to demand that she also cut all ties with the men. She refused and tempers flared. He accused her of favoring his former workers over her own son, and she shot back by insulting his husband. That was the last time they spoke for years, apart from occasional barbs traded in the media. Fortunately, their attitudes mellowed over time. In 2015, John started mending fences by sending his mother a massive bouquet of flowers for her 90th birthday. Social media posts and kind public remarks suggest the two managed to fully reconcile by the time of her passing in 2017. If scores of hit songs and millions of album sales aren't enough proof that Sir Elton John was something of a musical prodigy, there's also the fact that the Royal Academy of Music in London once offered him a scholarship. The school took notice of the young John, who had taught himself to play the piano when he was just four years old, offering him a scholarship to attend their youth program when he was 11. However, fate beckoned, and John ultimately found that rock and roll was closer to his artistic sensibilities. At 17, he decided that formal education was no longer his jam, so he dropped out in order to make his name in pop music. While this was certainly an excellent career move, John didn't really intend to rebel against his school, at least not in the long run. He's very much a believer in higher musical education to the point that he endows scholarship funds at the Juilliard School of Music in his own alma mater. In 1971, John managed to release no fewer than three different albums. There was the live album called 171170, a soundtrack to a little-known movie called Friends, and finally Madman Across the Water, which includes the beloved Tiny Dancer. 
His album from 1970, Tumbleweed Connection, also charted during 1971. After a year like that, most artists would have had the decency to at least pretend they were slightly out of gas, if only to prevent every other musician from developing an inferiority complex. However, Elton John is not most artists, so he immediately followed his insane year with 1972's Honky Chateau, which included a little song called Rocket Man. When John honored the deceased Princess Diana with his 1997 mega-hit rendition of Candle in the Wind, it didn't come out of nowhere. He'd been a friend of the royal family since the 70s, and he even met Princess Diana in 1981 at Prince Andrew's birthday party. The princess and the musician danced alone for 20 minutes and became fast friends. Their relationship was friendly and warm until 1997, when John and fashion designer Johnny Versace released a coffee table book which featured pictures of the royal family alongside photos of semi-nude male models. A shocked Diana refused to speak to John for months, and the two only reconciled when Versace was murdered later that year. Tragically, their rekindled relationship would only last for a few weeks before Diana herself died in a car crash, and John found himself playing at her funeral. To this day, the musician considers the late princess an angel and has remained on friendly terms with her family. Despite the fact that his style is probably best suited for arenas and opulent Las Vegas casino shows, John has been known to take the occasional smaller gig. He played a particularly strange one in 2010 when he performed at the wedding of Rush Limbaugh, the controversial right-wing radio host who's been accused of, among other things, homophobia and AIDS denialism. Since John is a gay man himself and a leading AIDS activist, it may seem weird that he agreed to play at the wedding reception of a shock jock who's been known to downplay the disease. However, there's a pretty good chance that the singer knew perfectly well what he was doing and that he had the last laugh. After all, he reportedly charged Limbaugh $1 million for the performance and sent every last cent of the profits to the Elton John AIDS Foundation. It's impossible to talk about Elton John's career without mentioning Bernie Taupin. They've been songwriting partners since 1967 when the two men both answered a job advertisement that Liberty Records had placed to find singer-songwriter talent. John was a prodigious pianist and could write a mean tune, but he struggled with lyrics. Since Taupin happened to be a prolific lyricist, Liberty decided to pair the two. As a result, they wrote about 20 songs before they even met for the first time. But John and Toppin collaborate in an unusual way. Toppin writes the lyrics first, and John composes the song based on the text. The whole process is remote, they've only ever worked on a song in the same room a couple of times. The different ways they've handled fame and fortune have been equally peculiar. While John has embraced the limelight, Toppin has managed to dodge the kind of celebrity that usually follows when you write dozens of iconic songs and sell millions of records. Peter Frampton, who made the best-selling live album, 1976's Frampton Comes Alive, clearly has an enviable resume as a musician. However, there are several interesting facts about his career that many fans might not know about. This is the untold truth of Peter Frampton. As a teenager, Peter Frampton got his first big break as the lead singer and guitarist of a band called The Herd. Compared to Frampton's later output as a musician, The Herd's songs were vastly different. The group specialized in psychedelic pop rock, as evidenced in their first single, 1967's I Can Fly. Unfortunately, the single flopped, but their next two were much more successful. The Herd broke out with an uncharacteristically poppy song, but just like many other originally harder-edged or niche bands, the group found themselves pressured to record more mainstream material. Frampton and keyboardist Andy Bound were not happy with this change in direction and it wasn't helping matters that the young frontman was getting marketed as a teen heartthrob. Rave magazine named him the face of 1968, and he was getting noticed far more often for his good looks than his guitar playing skills. By the end of 1968, Frampton, then only 18 years old, was clearly frustrated with his teen idol status. At that time, he had become close friends with Small Faces frontman Steve Marriott, and it seemed like a possibility that he would soon be joining the R&B-influenced rockers as their new lead guitarist. Similar to Peter Frampton, Steve Marriott bristled at the fact he was considered among the UK's leading teen idols of the mid to late 60s. Like his Small Faces bandmates, he also wasn't a fan of the shiny, poppy singles the band's label preferred to release, such as Sha La 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 Lee. So it's little wonder that he saw a kindred spirit in Frampton, and that he started lobbying for his inclusion in the Small Faces even when he was still with the Herd. The other Small Faces, however, didn't think it was a good idea. The band's keyboardist, Ian McLagan, had this to say about Frampton joining the Small Faces. 
I love Pete, but it wasn't the right move for us. Maybe we should have got a trumpeter, not another guitarist. Likewise, bassist Ronnie Lane, who was feuding with songwriting partner Marriott as their band continued to splinter, was not enthusiastic about the thought of the Herd's pretty boy singer-guitarist joining the fold. Things came to a head when Marriott walked out in the middle of a Small Faces show in Paris on New Year's Eve 1968. They played a few more shows in Germany before breaking up in March 1969. While Lane, McLagan, and drummer Kenny Jones recruited singer Rod Stewart and guitarist Ronnie Wood and became the Faces, Marriott and Frampton finally got their chance to team up as they formed Humble Pie with bassist Greg Ridley and drummer Jerry Shirley. All told, Peter Frampton's stint in Humble Pie was rather short-lived. He recorded two albums with the blues rockers before leaving in 1971 to start a solo career. By 1976, he was on top of his game as one of the world's biggest rock stars, thanks to his live double album, Frampton Comes Alive. The singles Baby I Love Your Way, Do You Feel Like We Do, and Show Me The Way were all huge hits, and 1977's I'm In You was his highest charting song to date, peaking at number two on the Billboard Hot 100. Then it all came crashing down one year later, when he played Billy Shears in the disastrous movie adaptation of the Beatles' classic album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Despite starring Frampton, the Bee Gees, and dozens of other leading musicians, Sgt. Pepper's was an absolute flop, with barely a semblance of a cohesive plot. The acting was also subpar, with Goldmine noting, Frampton spent a good portion of the 83-minute debacle smiling, bearing his chest, walking around in all his blonde, blow-dried glory and acting highly confused. That's not the kind of review any rock star wants to see. And for Frampton, he was essentially reduced to flash-in-the-pan status before he even turned 30. It wasn't just the abject failure of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band that contributed to Peter Frampton's decline. He temporarily put his music career on hold after a serious car accident. I fell asleep at the wheel. How bad a shape were you in? I was a mess. Pretty much a mess. It took a collaboration with childhood friend David Bowie to get Frampton back on track. You grew up with Bowie. He's my buddy. However, Frampton was no longer the main man. Instead, he was playing lead guitar on Bowie's 1987 record Never Let Me Down and the tour that followed the album's release. While this was Frampton's highest profile gig since, well, Sgt. Pepper's, it wasn't like Never Let Me Down was a critical darling. Far from it, in fact. Spectrum culture covered the album's many perceived faults, including songs that were too long for the pop radio format, a confusing mishmash of genres, and unfortunately, Frampton's guitar playing. Never Let Me Down was still a modest hit, however, peaking at number 34 on the Billboard 200 and spawning two top 30 hits on the Hot 100. With his appearances on The Simpsons and Family Guy, Peter Frampton had a great time parodying himself on the two iconic animated series. But his most important contribution to modern pop culture was arguably the behind-the-scenes work he did on the set of Cameron Crowe's 2000 movie Almost Famous. Frampton noted in his autobiography, Do You Feel Like I Do, a memoir, that he was present for the entirety of pre-production as he wrote some songs for the fictional band Stillwater and helped Billy Crudup who played Stillwater guitarist Russell Hammond, looked like a plausible 1970s guitar guy. Frampton wrote, Billy Crudup only had a couple of weeks of guitar lessons before we met. It amazed me how quickly he picked it all up. The playing and the stance were all important. So I was an on-set library of band information to help Billy and Jason Lee create their characters. The veteran rocker also served as an authenticity advisor who made sure all the musical equipment used in Almost Famous was appropriate for the era. Although Crudup was a fast learner, his guitar parts as Russell were actually played by Frampton and Pearl Jam axman Mike McCready. And in a nice little Easter egg for classic rock fans, Frampton also had a brief cameo in Almost Famous, playing a humble pie roadie named Reg. It all comes full circle, and with a career like his, who knows what Peter Frampton will do next? It's the Rolling Stones. It's tough to stress just how important the group has been to the world of rock and roll. Here are some things you may not know about this legendary band. You really think you're going to get the Rolling Stones to do a TV ad? Remember that one episode of Mad Men where Don Draper tries to score an agreement with the Stones to record a jingle for Heinz Baked Beans? Sounds unlikely? Well, as he points out, they've done it before. 
The cereal was Rice Krispies. And because the internet never forgets anything, ever, the curious can still check it out. But is it really them or just a sound alike? Real or fake? Snopes got confirmation from Kellogg's that it was, indeed, the Stones singing that chirpy little jingle. It was even written by Brian Jones and aired only in the United Kingdom about a year before the band got huge with the release of Satisfaction. If the Rolling Stones had opted to stick with their original name and stay known as the Blues Boys, would music lovers still be as impressed? It was their break, and Brian Jones was talking to Jazz News when he needed a name, fast. Fortunately, there was a Muddy Waters album sitting nearby, track 5, Rolling Stone. They stuck with that for the first performance, and the rest is history. So what about that infamous logo? There's a rumor it's based on Mick Jagger's distinctive pout, but that's just part of the story. What really happened, says Radio X, is that the Stones called John Pash, an art student from the Royal College of Art, and commissioned him to design a logo for them. Jagger had some inspiration to offer him, the Hindu goddess Kali. He found a drawing of her with a very pointed tongue, and Pash himself later said, A lot of people asked me if it was based on Mick Jagger's lips, and I have to say it wasn't, initially, but it might have been something that was unconscious and also really dovetailed into the basic idea of the design. It's kind of a universal statement, I mean, sticking out your tongue. Anyone who's been to a Stones concert post-1994 might have noticed the new guy filling Bill Wyman's shoes on bass. Well, he's not so new anymore. His name is Daryl Jones, even though he rarely appears in the group's promotional materials. He also hasn't actually been credited with being a real Rolling Stone, even though he's played on pretty much every song, album, and tour since he joined. And it's a big deal, one that means he's hired on and paid like other backup musicians instead of being entitled to a full cut of the band's profits. He's told the BBC, I've been a sideman for more than 30 years now, and I would not be being completely honest if I said that it would not be wonderful it would not be amazing to be considered and, you know, jump into this organization as a full member. But that is not a decision I am in a position to make. Jones isn't the only one who's been in that position. Ronnie Wood was a side guy for more than 10 years before he was made an official member of the group. And remember Ian Stewart, the keyboardist who was in the group for more than 25 years, starting in the 60s? If not, that's probably because manager Andrew Lug Oldham pushed him out of all the promo materials for the band because he didn't look the part. Few rock and roll stories are more tragic than the story of Brian Jones, the rhythm guitarist for the Stones from the beginning. Rolling Stone was reporting on his untimely death in 1969, just seven years after the group was formed. Jones had been pulled from the bottom of his swimming pool, dead by the time paramedics got there. The official ruling was misadventure, and there were all kinds of reports of sleeping pills, alcohol, and drugs all playing a part. Sadly, no one was truly surprised. As he'd been fired from the group just a month earlier, on the heels of an arrest over drug charges. According to Rolling Stone, Jones had floated away from the group post-Beggar's Banquet and announced he would be leaving not long after. Was his death an open and shut case? Just another story of the rock and roll lifestyle taking a brilliant musician too soon? Maybe, maybe not. In 2009, The Guardian reported that more than 600 new documents pertaining to Jones' death had been handed over to police. That sparked rumors all over again, whispered speculation that he hadn't died accidentally, but that he'd been murdered. The story most frequently repeated by friends was that he had actually been killed by a builder working on his home. Will the truth ever come out? Perhaps it already has. But that doesn't mean the story of Brian Jones' tragic death won't remain disputed. Part of the problem that comes with sifting through the Stones' history and trying to make sense of it all is that it's a little foggy. Take 1977. That was the year Rolling Stone says Keith Richards ended up getting a suspended sentence for a heroin conviction in Canada. And part of that sentence was to play a benefit concert for the blind. It wasn't just a small, token affair, either. Around 10,000 people were in attendance. And in spite of Oshawa, Ontario residents worrying their city was about to be pillaged and burned to the ground, everyone was Canadian-level polite. 2,600 of those tickets were reserved for blind concertgoers. And how that came about is Stones-level strange. According to The Rolling Stones, a musical biography, the band had befriended a blind woman named Rita Better, 
whom they met after she hitchhiked to all their shows. Richards had volunteered to give her a ride himself, and she was so impressed by his thoughtfulness that after his arrest, she approached the judge and appealed for leniency and suggested they perform the benefit concert in lieu of jail time. Sure, it sounds unlikely, and even the Stones biographer expressed doubts it ever happened. But the concert was played, Richards didn't go to jail, and in 2015, he tweeted a picture of himself reunited with Bedard, his blind angel from Toronto. Cocaine, heroin, LSD. It's not just the Stones that are associated with some of the most hardcore drugs out there. At the time, especially, drugs were a major part of the entire music industry. But Keith Richards has a reputation for elevating drug use into something supernatural. According to Richards, entire tours, particularly one in 1975, were entirely fueled by a type of pharmaceutical-grade cocaine called Merck cocaine. It's called Merck cocaine because the German pharmaceutical company Merck was once a major supplier. Medicinal cocaine had been around for so long that Sigmund Freud also extolled the virtues of the same stuff, officially used as a local anesthetic. All drug runs have to come to an end sometime, though, and that particular high came to a screeching halt in Fordyce, Arkansas. The Rolling Stones were busted with a car full of the stuff and somehow talked their way out of drug charges. God knows what I'm on about in that song. It's such a mishmash, all the nasty subjects in one go. That's what Mick Jagger had to say about brown sugar in 1995, when Rolling Stone asked him just what was up with what was one of their most controversial songs. According to Jagger, he wrote Brown Sugar while he was in Australia, working on the movie Ned Kelly and attempting to rehabilitate himself after a hand injury. He was surprised it was as successful as it was, and added, I would never write that song now. I would probably censor myself. I'd think, oh God, I can't. I've got to stop. I can't just write raw like that. There are plenty of fascinating tidbits in the song's history. It was written about a strange combination of sex, slavery, and interracial relationships, which makes it even stranger that it was recorded in Alabama, a state that had laws on the books making interracial marriage illegal until 2000. The first time it was played in public was just as controversial. It debuted at their ill-fated free concert at Altamont. It's not just the listeners who think the lyrics aged poorly, with many modern listeners finding them to be a little bit too edgy and racist and misogynistic. And the band seems to agree with this. Jagger regularly changes the words to the song when it's performed in concert, and both he and Keith Richards have had a tendency to distance themselves from the content of their own song. Gimme Shelter is an incredible Rolling Stones song, in no small part because of the addition of a powerful female vocalist. That soul singer Mary Clayton, who had already worked with names like Elvis Presley and Ray Charles long before the Stones gave her a call. It was a phone call that was responsible for one of the most chilling performances given on a Stones album. According to Clayton, it was nearly midnight when the phone rang on the night she recorded her vocals for the song. Her husband initially said no to her involvement because at the time she was very late in pregnancy, but Clayton eventually went. I'm going to wear this out real good so I can get back to my warm spot. She had to sit down to sing, did only three takes, and was done. History had been made, and soon, tragedy would strike. Not long after she left the studio, she suffered a miscarriage, possibly brought on by the stress and intensity of her late-night performance. She would later say that for years, she was completely unable to listen to the song because of the memories. And the Stones have never forgotten. In 2015, Clayton was awarded the Clark and Gwen Terry Award for Courage through the Jazz Foundation of America, and Keith Richards was on hand to perform Gimme Shelter live. Clayton herself, the New York Times said, was accepting the award via a taped segment from her LA home. She was only slowly returning to the public eye after being in a tragic car accident and losing both her legs. On August 24, 2021, the Rolling Stones shared some heartbreaking news in the form of a statement that read, in part, It is with immense sadness that we announce the death of our beloved Charlie Watts. He passed away peacefully in a London hospital earlier today, surrounded by his family. Details amid a request for privacy were sparse. But Variety noted that his passing came not long after he pulled out of a rescheduled post-COVID concert tour. He was replaced by Steve Jordan, and Watts explained, For once, my timing has been a little off. 
I am working hard to get fully fit, but I have today accepted on the advice of the experts that this will take a while. Watts had undergone an unspecified medical procedure, and while doctors had said it was completely successful, a subsequent recovery period was necessary. He last performed with the group at an August 2019 concert in Miami and during a pandemic live stream in 2020. He is survived by his wife, Shirley, who he married in 1964, and their daughter, Serafina. He was 80 years old and had been a member of the Stones for 58 of those years. Keith Richards once summed up what it was like to work with him, saying, Charlie Watts is one of the best hidden assets I've had. I can throw him ideas and I never have to worry about the beat. It's a blessing. Bruce Springsteen has been making his mark on the world's musical landscape since the early 70s, and he shows no signs of slowing down. From international triumphs to personal struggles, these are some of the key moments that not only made Bruce Springsteen the artist, but also Bruce Springsteen the man. Bruce Springsteen's 1973 album, Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, was his first release, and in a way, it's also his most important. After all, it was the album that introduced the world to the music of the young New Jersey musician. And as Rolling Stone tells us, for Springsteen, the album represented a make-or-break opportunity where he needed to push his craft to the next level. While he'd been making waves in the local music scene for years, Springsteen now decided to really focus on songwriting and draw lyrical inspiration from his personal experiences and surroundings. Throughout the years, he often reflected on this decision. I wanted to tell my story, my parents' story, my town's story, and ultimately I wanted to tell your story. Springsteen's distinct songwriting voice can be heard throughout his acclaimed debut. However, before the album was released, Columbia Records wanted to promote him as being a singer-songwriter from New York City instead of New Jersey. He pushed back hard on this marketing tactic by insisting that the album be called Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Springsteen described the dispute to Melody Maker in 1975. I said, wait, you guys are nuts or something. I'm from Asbury Park, New Jersey. Could you dig it? New Jersey. I said, I want this on the album cover. They fought and fought, but we finally got it put on. During the making of 1975's Born to Run, Springsteen was haunted by a feeling that it was his last chance to make anything of himself. As Rolling Stone reports, he wasn't just being paranoid. His record company had undergone a major personnel shuffle and the people left afloat weren't particularly supportive of him at the time, so he was quite possibly justified in thinking that he faced a do-or-die situation. With no real backup plan if he failed, Springsteen reacted by driving himself and the E Street Band into the ground during the arduous process of recording the album. The painful sessions took so long that the album's namesake single had been out for six months by the time they were done with the rest of the songs. Springsteen was so exhausted that he started hating the record and actually threw a copy of it in a pool after hearing the mastered version for the first time. Fortunately, Springsteen would soon realize that all of the hard work was actually worth it. Born to Run became one of the most praised and enduring rock albums ever released. Bruce Springsteen is the kind of guy who makes artists half his age go pale when they see his touring schedule and concert lengths. Some of his shows in the 2010s have been known to last up to four hours. However, Springsteen has always put 100% into his performances from day one. As Ultimate Classic Rock tells us, the boss made his name as a touring workhorse and masterful performer during a stage of his career when he wasn't well known nationally. This wasn't only to give concert goers a great show, it was also to help grow his audience. Like if you want it, you get it. You better go take it, you better go work for it, you know? And uh, that's what I'm interested in. After the success of Born to Run, Springsteen experienced a major career crisis. He'd spent close to three years lingering in limbo thanks to bitter legal struggles with his manager and was restricted from playing live. By the time he was free to get back on stage, Springsteen felt he had to sell himself to the public all over again, which he did by taking his band on the road and playing over 110 concerts, with each show averaging just shy of three hours apiece. And he wore his heart on his sleeve for every single one of those seconds. The raw emotion Springsteen displayed, along with the sheer quality of his tunes, won the public over, and by the time the tour finished, the boss had cemented his status as one of the most electrifying performers in rock. Plus, I want to give people something that they're hopefully never going to forget. You know, I want to do something that feels, that feels epic to them. Bruce Springsteen's 1980 double album, The River, was a critical and commercial success thanks to its well-rounded collection of songs that balanced profound stories, 
heartfelt ballads and upbeat rockers. The album even included a radio-friendly hit titled Hungry Heart, a tune Bruce Springsteen originally wrote for the Ramones. Following up an act like The River was never going to be easy, and Ultimate Classic Rock tells us the boss originally intended to stick to his winning formula with another stirring rock album. However, he soon ran into a problem. His new songs, while powerful, were dark and moody, and the rousing rock of the E Street Band was a bad fit for them. Springsteen had recorded his new songs on a portable four-track cassette recorder in his bedroom. The acoustic demos captured on that tape had a raw emotion that he found much more impactful than the finished versions he and the E Street Band were tinkering with. As a result, Springsteen decided to take a creative chance and release his lo-fi solo takes as his next album. The end result was 1982's Nebraska, an introspective, no-hype work that The Guardian ranks as one of his top five albums. Springsteen evidently liked the stripped-down acoustic process so much he took a similar route on 1995's The Ghost of Tom Joad, and again in 2005 for Devils and Dust. Bruce Springsteen has been with his wife Patty Schialfa for decades now, but his first marriage to model and actress Julianne Phillips was significantly shorter and more complicated. Springsteen met Phillips in 1984 and they married less than a year later. Unfortunately, their relationship soon became emotionally distant. The seeds of disaster were present quite early as Springsteen went through a series of what he describes as anxiety attacks after the wedding, realizing that he wasn't ready to settle down. Their marriage was essentially over just two years after the wedding, and they finally divorced in 1989. In his 2016 autobiography Born to Run, Springsteen places a lot of the blame about the way things went wrong with his marriage squarely on himself. Before Ski Alpha, he used to have a tendency to end his relationships after three years at most due to his difficult childhood, which rendered him unable to accept that his partners could genuinely love him. In his book, Springsteen expressed that he feels sorry about Phillips getting the brunt of his unhealthy attitude. He wrote, I deeply cared for Julianne and her family, and my poor handling of this is something I regret to this day. I failed her as a husband and partner. Rock stars and unhealthy relationships go together like peaches and cream. But Springsteen has fared much better with his second marriage than his first, and all it took was marrying a bandmate. Throughout the Born in the USA and Tunnel of Love tour, Springsteen found himself growing closer with E Street Band member and longtime friend Patty Schialfa. This eventually led to them becoming an item. Unfortunately, Springsteen was still married at the time. The affair was one of the main factors in the end of his first marriage. Despite the less than optimal start of their relationship, the boss found Schialfa to be his perfect partner. In his autobiography, Springsteen wrote about their deep connection. We hoped, with work, our broken pieces might fit together in a way that would create something workable, wonderful. They did. We created a life and a love fit for a couple of emotional outlaws. That similarity bound and binds us very close. After a few years of keeping the relationship out of the spotlight, Springsteen and Ski Alpha tied the knot in 1991 and have been a couple ever since. They've shared stages together all over the world, and back home in New Jersey, they raised three children together. Depression might not be the first thing you'd associate with an electric, forceful performer like Bruce Springsteen, but it's a disease he's battled all his life. As The Guardian tells us, he's actually experienced crushing breakdowns that have left him feeling, quote, like an empty vessel since 1982. He still has no clue about all the triggers of his mental health troubles, but he's very open about them and has grown to recognize the warning signs early on. It's like this thing that engulfs you. I got to where I didn't want to get out of bed, you know. Springsteen's aware that mental health issues run in his family, and he suspects he got into music as a teenager at least partially in order to combat depression. Most importantly, he's more than willing to reach out for help. When his wife recognizes an impending case of what Springsteen eloquently refers to as, quote, a freight train bearing down, loaded with nitroglycerin and running quickly out of track, they will seek a doctor and get his medication up to date. Springsteen also knows there's no shame in seeking out professional help, and he saw his first psychotherapist as early as the 1980s. Bruce Springsteen's most glorious stadium rabble-rouser, born in the USA, has all the makings of an unofficial national anthem, as long as you don't really listen to the lyrics. The song is actually from the viewpoint of a desperate Vietnam vet who returns to a country that has no place for him anymore. Biography writes that when Springsteen was about to face the draft, his sole thought was, quote, I ain't going. So he put on an act during his physical exam that involved pretending to be high on LSD, acting like a maniac, and invoking a concussion from a past motorcycle accident. He was granted a 4F classification and avoided the war. 
According to Time magazine, Springsteen was filled with guilt for years about it. During his one-man show, Springsteen on Broadway, he reflected on avoiding military service. So I do sometimes wonder who went in my place, because somebody did. Besides just singing about the war, Springsteen is an influential and generous figure in Vietnam veteran charity circles. Among many veteran causes that Springsteen has supported over the decades, he has headlined the annual Stand Up For Heroes benefit concert almost every year since 2007, helping the Bob Woodruff Foundation raise $55 million for veterans' causes. With his 2019 album, Western Stars, Springsteen explored a new musical direction and celebrated some styles that might seem surprising to longtime fans, including late 60s pop and early 70s country. Also, instead of the relatively pared-down arrangements of his previous solo albums or the bombastic sound of the E Street Band, the album is heavily orchestrated. The sound of Western Stars is influenced by such classic artists as Harry Nielsen and Glenn Campbell. Lyrically, Springsteen has populated Western stars with a series of characters who are down on their luck or a little past their prime, he told Sunrise. But if you fill those songs and those characters with enough authentic emotion, it resonates with your audience. Springsteen opted against touring in support of the album, but luckily for fans, he released a feature-length movie of the entire album being performed live. More than just a simple concert film, the movie was shot in a 100-year-old barn on Springsteen's property and featured an orchestra. Also, between songs, the film includes vignettes of Springsteen discussing his life and philosophies against a backdrop of home movies and shots of him exploring the American West. Variety praised the film, saying, In Western Stars, Springsteen spins his confessions into a beautiful and haunting tone poem. It's a moving testament to how much Bruce Springsteen has still got it. While most fans only care about Springsteen's music, some folks can't help but wonder about this international celebrity's financial worth. According to Forbes, Springsteen's net worth in 2016 was a cool $460 million, which made him the 14th wealthiest celebrity in the U.S. His most impressive asset is perhaps a 200-acre horse farm in New Jersey that's valued at $10 million. However, Springsteen's current fortune isn't the most impressive thing about his financial history. That honor goes to the sheer touring revenue he's generated over his many decades of life on the road. Between the 1970s and 2016, his various tours have grossed an estimated $1.5 billion. Of course, Springsteen isn't the type of artist who measures success by wealth or awards. Through the years, though, he's also received every type of honor imaginable. In addition to being one of the world's best-selling artists, he's won Grammy Awards, Golden Globes, an Academy Award, and a Tony Award. He also received the Music Cares Person of the Year Award, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and in 2016, Springsteen received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Still, that's not what it's all about for him. Rather than be rich or rather than be famous, I wanted to be great. I wanted the music to have meaning, to reach out and touch people's lives. As one of the biggest rock bands of the 60s and 70s, there's no denying the colossal mark Pink Floyd left on music. From the early days of Sid Barrett, to the wall, to today. This is the untold truth of Pink Floyd. Pink Floyd performed under some pretty interesting names before settling on their famous moniker. As revealed by Far Out, the band tried their luck with the Megadeths, the Spectrum Five, the Screaming Abdabs, and another unique option, the T-Set. As Far Out points out, this latter option actually made a little bit of sense. After all, it seemed to resonate with the band's LSD-induced sonic adventures that co-founder Sid Barrett would start going on around this time. Ultimately, however, the group decided to change the name yet again. And as Echoes, the complete history of Pink Floyd points out, this was probably due to another London-based band that was utilizing the same handle. So, why did they settle on the name Pink Floyd? Well, the reason isn't exactly exciting. As Echoes explains, the change was very spur of the moment due to a lack of better ideas, and it simply just stuck. It was Barrett who came up with the now-famous moniker due to his record collection. Pink came from Pink Anderson, while Floyd was from Floyd Dipper Boy Council, both Carolinas-based blues artists. As Roger Waters famously quipped, Anderson Council was their other option, which would have sounded like, quote, a local authority. Would Pink Floyd have existed without Sid Barrett? The co-founding guitarist was crucial, having served as a primary writer for the group's debut album, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, in 1967. As Roger Waters gushed to Rolling Stone, 
What was so stunning about Sid's songs was, through the whimsy and the crazy juxtaposition of ideas and words, there was a very powerful grasp of humanity. They were quintessentially human songs. And yet, although Barrett's songs carried that grasp of humanity, he was slowly losing his grip on it too. His unique ability to write imaginative songs was partially due to his steady overconsumption of LSD, which ultimately led to a mental breakdown. According to Echoes, as Pink Floyd's success grew, Barrett began to feel the pressures of fame, causing him to withdraw from the nonstop work. After a year of bizarre and troubling behavior, Pink Floyd replaced Barrett with David Gilmour. By April 1968, Pink Floyd announced that Barrett was no longer a member of the band. Sid Barrett attempted a solo career, giving his final interview as a musician to Rolling Stone in 1971. Hauntingly, he told the outlet, quote, I'm disappearing, with the magazine noting that his eyes were now in a permanent state of shock. Tragically, the guitarist faded into obscurity and moved back home to Cambridge, where he mostly kept to himself. Sid Barrett died from pancreatic cancer in 2006. Pink Floyd's eighth album, Dark Side of the Moon, is considered a rock classic. It was released in the U.S. on March 1, 1973, entering the top 200 chart later that month. A remarkable 14 years later, the album finally fell off the Billboard 200. Along with a later appearance on the chart again, coupled with an additional 759 weeks on the top pop catalog album chart, Dark Side of the Moon spent a stunning 1,500 weeks on the charts. Needless to say, it made the UK rockers a pretty penny. Interestingly enough, Dark Side of the Moon, as legendary as it is, is tied in with another British cult classic. According to Rolling Stone, while Pink Floyd was recording Dark Side of the Moon, they spent their free time watching the comedy ensemble series Monty Python's Flying Circus. When it was time for the actors to shoot their first full-length feature film, 1975's Monty Python and the Holy Grail, they struggled to pony up the dough. Well, actually, I, I am a knight of the round table. You're a knight, knight of the round table? I am. In that case, I shall have to kill you. Q. Pink Floyd. The film's director, Terry Gilliam, revealed to The Guardian, none of the movie studios would give us any money. This was at the time income tax was running as high as 90%, so we turned to rock stars for finance. Elton John, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, they all had money, and we seemed a good tax write-off. Ultimately, Pink Floyd gave 10% of the film's initial budget of 200,000 British pounds, according to Rolling Stone. George Orwell's World War II-era novella, Animal Farm, was an instant success, with the first edition selling out in a mere month. The story revolves around a group of animals rebelling against the farmers that owned them, an allegory that warns against allowing totalitarians to have all complete political power. Man! Man is our enemy! This classic tale also served as the inspiration for Pink Floyd's 1977 concept album, Animals. It wouldn't be the only time Pink Floyd took a bold social stance. After all, they would follow up with 1979's boisterous political commentary on The Wall. However, Animals served as a stepping stone for future concept album success. Coming in at only five songs, Roger Waters adapted Orwell's book into his lyrics and titles. As far-out notes, the sheep are the mindless followers, the dogs are the wannabe imperialists, and the pigs are the rulers. There will be no more meetings, no more endless debates. From now on, a special committee of pigs will decide all aspects of the farm. As Phil Rose points out in Roger Waters and Pink Floyd the Concept albums, even the album cover of Animals holds significance to the point Waters is attempting to make. Since the pigs are the rulers, a large inflatable swine is seen suspended high above London's Battersea Power Station, which was once a symbol of power in industrial London. In 1977, Pink Floyd played at the Olympic Stadium in Montreal. According to the National Post, it was the largest stadium rock concert in Canada, coming in at a whopping 80,000 unruly fans. Wayne Larson of the Montreal Gazette was actually in that crowd, near the front. Recalling the very rowdy crowd, Larson explains that the mood of the concert was killed by fireworks, one of which went off close to Roger Waters' head. According to Larson, Waters screamed, Stop lighting off fireworks! Sure enough, the chaos didn't stop, and according to several accounts, roadies ended up grabbing one of the firecracker culprits. The roadies then dragged him up to the stage and held him while water spat in his face. This Montreal concert was the last that the band played before recording The Wall, and it served as a huge inspiration. As Waters told the National Post in 2016, What I think happened was that I was angry. With all due respect to the population of Montreal, they were completely drunk. Adding that reflecting about the moment he realized he was in the wrong, he couldn't shake off the fact that the incident didn't make him, quote, feel human. 
As such, Waters came up with The Wall, which he says involved building a huge wall between himself and the folks he was trying to communicate with. The year 1982 saw the release of Pink Floyd, The Wall, a movie based on the band's record of the same name and one of the most celebrated albums of all time. Roger Ebert dubbed it, quote, the best of all serious fiction films devoted to rock, and the flick won two BAFTA awards the following year. Simply put, Pink Floyd, The Wall became a cult classic, so some fans may be surprised to hear just how difficult it was to get this movie finished. In an essay on his website, the film's director Alan Parker declared, I'm very proud of it, but the making of the film was too miserable an exercise. As it turned out, Parker's main difficulty came from singer-songwriter Roger Waters and Gerald Scarf, the cartoonist who helped Waters create The Wall's extravagant stage show. As Parker himself explained, Waters' personality was, quote, intimidating, especially when it came to suggesting anything outside his own personal vision for the movie, which caused tensions between himself and Scarf. According to Far Out, the animator was so distressed and anxious about working on the project that he turned to drinking, and was usually seen with a flask of whiskey. As Parker explains, he wouldn't see Waters for decades after the opening of the flick. Meanwhile, whenever Parker bumped into Scarf, the cartoonist would shudder. Scarf, however, would eventually make amends with Parker. The amphitheater found in the ancient Roman city of Pompeii once housed up to 12,000 spectators and was home to brutal gladiatorial fights, along with more light-hearted circus acts. When nearby Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD, it wiped out the population of Pompeii, and the city hauntingly remained buried until the 1700s when it was rediscovered. Almost 300 years later, that very same amphitheater was the venue for probably one of the most bizarre concerts of all time, Pink Floyd, live at Pompeii. As the director of the documentary, Adrian Mabin told Brain Damage he chose Pompeii as the venue because he liked the contradiction of playing live in a, quote, place that is dead. Since Pink Floyd were to play to virtually no audience, the idea to resurrect the dead city came to him in the hope that ghosts of the past could somehow return. The shots of empty Pompeii combined with Pink Floyd's melodies gave it a captivating result. As Mabin told Prague, road manager Peter Watts told him that the sound had somewhat of an echo to it. Watts also made note of the fact that the Romans who built the amphitheater thought not only of the structure, but also of the acoustic qualities. As David Gilmour said years later in 2015, I don't think any of us thought it would last in people's minds for as long as it did. Dark Side of the Moon is undeniably Pink Floyd's greatest effort, with tens of millions of copies sold since its release in 1973. Naturally, with so many people listening to it over the years, fans have tried analyzing it, while others have even started making bizarre connections to other works of art. A viral 1995 article by the Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette claimed that the band's eighth album synced up perfectly with 1939's fantasy classic, The Wizard of Oz. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. As the article explains, there exists a connection, no, really a synchronicity, between the two that escapes logic or understanding. The article goes on to say how the lyrics allegedly match the plot of the film, while the characters' movements go perfectly with the music. So, is there any truth to this now popular claim? The answer is a disappointing no. As drummer Nick Mason bluntly told BBC One in 2010, he finds it unthinkable that Pink Floyd would create an album around The Wizard of Oz, Mason added. Sadly, both the Tin Man and the Straw Man and all the rest of it had absolutely zero to do with that particular record. The remaining members of Pink Floyd have famously feuded for years. Things have gotten so bad, in fact, that The Independent dubbed it the greatest feud in rock. So, what exactly happened? In 1983, Pink Floyd released The Final Cut, the band's last album which featured founding member Roger Waters. Willie Christie, the photographer behind the album art, explained that a breakup was on the horizon, with both David Gilmour and Waters finding the recording process very tough and butting heads in the process. Waters famously left the band in favor of a solo career in 1985, under the impression that Pink Floyd as fans knew it would dissipate. That wasn't the case, and in 1987, Pink Floyd, without Waters, released a momentary lapse of reason, but it didn't come without hardship. The bassist ultimately sued his former bandmates in 1985 to prevent the Pink Floyd name from ever being used again. According to the BBC, he declared that the band was, quote, a spent force creatively. The battle lasted two years and was finally settled out of court. However, tension stuck for years, with the remaining members eventually reuniting on stage decades later. Finally, in 2013, Waters admitted to BBC's hard talk that he was wrong, adding, of course I was, who cares? 
Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.